your tongue is like a respiratory muscle, a breathing muscle. It's an organ that can seal off the airflow between the nasal and the oral cavities. Correct tongue posture helps lips stay closed. If you think of the tongue as like an expander for the palate, it's kind of like a natural orthodontic appliance. Your tongue is a natural expander for the palate and lips are kind of like braces for the teeth. So we need correct resting position and muscle use from early on to develop the jaws correctly. So as an adult, if you correct structure, even as a child or a teenager, but you don't address function, you can have as wide and four jaws as possible. But if your tongue is not maintaining tone to rest up, like we just talked about, and your lips are not staying closed when you sleep, you could still have complete collapse of your airway from that soft tissue. There's a saying in the war between muscle and bone, muscle will always win. I watched some of your uh, podcasts and YouTube. So you got into this just by being a patient in your own curiosity. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was a patient and then I started down the path of treatment in 2016 with some expanders. I started documenting my experience with the expander mm -hmm. and then it went totally haywire uh -huh. and I continued to document that. And a, a lot of other people were doing that expander too and wondering mm -hmm. what the hell's going on. So like I, I basically generated a following people who were just following my AGA case. Mm -hmm. And then I kept going. I moved on to MSE and I documented that and people were following me go through that process. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I started as a patient who was just documenting my own treatment. Okay. And did and, you seek treatment for airway issues or for more like facial growth? I had chronic headaches. Okay. So I was waking up with these debilitating headaches every other day for like five years. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was like the pain point that brought me to eventually discover airway issues. Cause basically I was like, well, I'm going to bed feeling good and I'm waking up feeling terrible. Hmm. What's happening in my sleep. Mm -hmm. And then it, at the, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. At the same time I was living at a Buddhist monastery that like oh. after college, I lived at a Buddhist monastery for four years in Southern California, not far from where you are actually in Valley center, California. Okay. It's okay. just East of Escondido. Mm hmm. Um, so I was like meditating all day, being with my body, feeling my body. Um, and then I realized like, I don't know what the hell to do with my tongue. My bite isn't quite right. I can only chew on one side. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a connection between like what's happening in my mouth in this neck pain and headaches that I'm having. Mm -hmm. And then one thing led to another and I realized my jaws were too small. Mm -hmm. And did you have orthodontic treatment as a child? I did. Yeah. I had wisdoms and premolars out. I'm down to 24 teeth and everything was pulled back. And then, but then the other thing that happened is in 2012, before I started traveling, mm -hmm. I had my retainers removed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when things really like spiraled down because that's when my bite fell apart for real. Like I was stable after my retractive extractive orthodontics for a couple of years, even though my headaches started in high school and then they got worse mm -hmm. um, through college. But then when I had my retainers out, that's when it got really bad. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think. It's also complex and there's so many moving parts, right? Yeah, right. There are. That's why the, when I do that screen share to show you, I kind of have a way where I compartmentalize it and make it somewhat black and white. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that. So you can tell me when you're, um, you didn't start the recording, did you? Uh, yeah. The way I do it is I just record and then I just, I edit in when it starts getting interesting because, <laughs> oh. because like when we're just chatting informally, yeah. so much like good shit comes out. You know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> exactly. It's more like conversational, which is great. Well, this is great. So you can go ahead and start how you would, and then <laughs> we'll chat more. Yeah. So um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This is the, the formal start. Today, I'm with Nicole Goldfarb, speech language pathologist and certified orofacial myologist, aka a myofunctional therapist. Myofunctional therapy is something that I've wanted to talk more about on this channel because I think it's probably the most underrated aspect of this health space that we're all in. Um, and most of my audience, Nicole is 
just looking for an expander. They just want to get bigger, purely uh, structure. Like they see structure and they think fixing structure will solve all other problems. But in my opinion, the structure is an opportunity, but you still need to take advantage of that opportunity by learning how to use all that space. What do you think? Well, let's back up. This is great. First <laughs> off, I'm wearing my Mayo Mouth shirt. Okay, I got to do that. Um, why is the structure a problem? Let's not have symptom-driven treatment, but what is the underlying cause of why is the structure incorrect? So what we need to first maybe understand is what is myofunctional therapy? Um, so I'm an orofacial myofunctional therapist, which is like the largest mouthful of words. But when I describe what that is to patients, I break it down into its components. Because a lot of people get referred to me and don't even know why. They're referred by the orthodontist, the dentist, and they're like, I'm here, I made it, I don't know why. So oro is mouth, facial is face, myo is muscle, and function is what those muscles do for the five basic tenets of the jobs of the mouth, for chewing and swallowing of food, liquids, saliva, speech, and oral rest posture. OK, so anything that gets in the way of those not working correctly, we need to treat and address because the underlying cause of malocclusion and the jaw issues, one of the hugest parts of that is soft tissue dysfunction, oral facial myofunctional disorders or problems with the muscles of the mouth or the soft tissue like tongue tie will change the way the face grows and develops, okay? So if we're just out there seeking an expander or jaw surgery or some orthodontic treatment, you're only treating one component, but not necessarily the underlying cause. So there's this interaction between form and function, and we have a bi-directional interaction. The form of our face and our jaws is influenced by the function the way our mouth rests and moves, the way we're using the muscles. And that's the triggering factor of how the mouth grows and develops. Okay, so I can talk a lot. So just stop me. <laughs> stop me once I start going. But so I think I think, Nicole, I think my audience at this point, my audience being 95% adults, 20 years old or, or older, yeah. they're going to say, sure, Nicole, obviously, if we all had perfect myofunctional habits as children, we would have developed good faces, but we're all adults now. Um, can our myofunctional habits, can changing uh, our myofunctional habits, our facial habits, um, still alter our structure at this at this point in our lives? Mm -hmm. Great question. Yes. So let's go over what the correct oral rest posture is, which sure. should happen at birth or even they're showing in fetal development. The mm. mouth should be resting correctly because if not, if the tongue is not resting in the correct position, even when in fetal development, the baby will come out with smaller jaws, retruded lower jaw, narrow palate. So if you t talk about the palate being the roof of the mouth, mm. the tongue needs to rest gently sucked up in the palate. The front, middle, and back of the tongue, let me get lined up with the camera there, front, middle, back sucked up with gentle suction like a suction cup. The saliva is kind of like glue for the tongue to stay suction. The tip of the tongue behind the front teeth, the sides of the tongue within the dental arch. So the tongue is not putting any pressure on the teeth. And that gentle suction of the tongue provides a counterbalancing force against the pressure of the cheeks. Um, in normal human anatomy, our cheeks are always putting a little bit of pressure on our teeth at the sides. That pressure needs to be counterbalanced by the tongue. If the tongue is resting low or floating in the middle of the mouth, not putting that force on the roof of the mouth, the cheeks are putting an unequal pressure and that can cause the jaw or the palate to narrow, okay? The roof of the mouth, as you know, is the floor of the nose. It's the same bone. So if the roof of the mouth narrows, the floor of the nose becomes narrow. There's less space in the nose to breathe. And also, if you think of the tongue as like an expander for the palate, it's kind of like a natural orthodontic appliance. Your tongue is a natural expander for the palate and lips are kind of like braces for the teeth. So we need good function and rest posture, lips closed, tongue sucked up, and that suction of the tongue will actually allow the lower jaw to drop and relax to get freeway space. So dental freeway space is a space between the upper and lower jaws. 
So it's a product of tongue being sucked up correctly, gentle suction, like, okay? The lower jaw can drop and relax, slight amount, just slight parting, take that pressure off of the facial muscles, off of the TMJ. So we need correct resting position and muscle use from early on to develop the jaws correctly. As we get older, though, if that's not proper and we're not chewing hard foods and using our muscles, because muscle makes bone form. And a lot of these younger children are put on uh, pacifiers, sucking pouches, we're pureed foods, and we're not using the muscles correctly. As you know, you're well aware of that process, I'm sure. Um, then the muscles don't develop correctly, the bones not develop correctly, and we have deficient faces, which mm -hmm. that affects our breathing and our sleep mm -hmm. and our posture. We get hunched over, we're in sort of a CPR position to try to breathe. So as adults and as we get older, now we have deficient form from poor function. Mm -hmm. So now we have to treat both. Even in childhood, we have to treat both when there's a problem. If you fix just the form and your tongue's still resting low and you're a mouth breather, your mouth's open or not, you could have your mouth closed, your lips closed and still have low tongue posture. You're still subject to relapse because there's a saying in the war between muscle and bone, muscle will always win. We have so many patients as adults, I treat the majority for me now is working with adults um, who have had expansion three times and the palate narrows. We shouldn't necessarily need retention appliances. That's what the tongue is for and the lips to hold that correct posture. So as an adult, if you correct structure, even as a child or a teenager, but you don't address function, there's a high risk for relapse orthodontically and there's a risk for continued problems. And when we're talking about airway and breathing and sleep, you can have as wide and four jaws as possible. But if your tongue is not maintaining tone to rest up, like we just talked about, and your lips are not staying closed when you sleep, you could still have complete collapse of your airway from that soft tissue. Mm -hmm. So there's an interaction between structure and function, form and function, and you need to correct both. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Of course it makes sense. You you mentioned the importance of suctioning the tongue onto the roof of the mouth. In my opinion, uh, I'm sure you've heard of mewing. Mm -hmm. And when people think of mewing, they think of pressing the tongue up onto the roof of the mouth. I did a video, uh, How to Mew, where I just instructed people to suction, uh, to swallow their spit until they create a suction on the roof of their mouth. And it got millions of views and everyone said, wow, finally, someone taught me like how to mew passively and in a way that I don't have to force it. Why do you think or do you think that this is a big shortcoming of the mewing community, that there's not as much of an emphasis on the suctioning of the tongue pressed on the roof of the mouth as opposed to uh, forcefully like uh, uh, ramming the tongue onto the roof of the mouth. Right. And I won't speak directly to the mewing aspect, but just in general, because I have a lot of patients who watch YouTube videos and um, try to get correct oral rest posture and realize it's not working. So pressing is a compensation. That's a, this should be a subconscious, unconscious um, rest posture based on correct muscle tone. If you're pressing, you're not using the muscles correctly. So we need to strengthen the muscles first. And we do like a sort of sequential program to strengthen the muscles to allow the elevator muscles to pull the tongue upwards in a subconscious way. So we do exercises to get, that's what myofunctional therapy is. It's kind of like physical therapy of the mouth. So we do exercises in a progressive way to strengthen the muscles of the tongue so it will gently suction to the roof of the mouth versus just pressing up. I almost think pressing up, you've skipped all the basic foundational steps of getting the muscles toned correctly, and you just know where the tongue goes, you're just gonna press it up there. So mm -hmm. there's uh, different muscles that need to be worked correctly to get that suction. And um, our patients, after they do their exercises correctly for a certain amount of time, it's unconscious. It's a subconscious rest posture. There's no conscious like, press my tongue up. That gentle suction occurs naturally. Um, and it's not just based on lips and tongue exercises. Strong muscles are the foundation for correct functioning. So we do the muscle exercises typically first. Um, exercises might be like 
like clicks. suck it ups. Yeah, I call them suck it ups, clicks. Um, variety of different exercises depending on the patient's needs, all based on an evaluation. And then we work on functioning. So chewing and swallowing of foods, liquid saliva, usually in that order. Um, if somebody just goes right to, let me try to swallow saliva correctly, or let me press my tongue up, or I know where my tongue should rest, so I'm just going to try to do it. You've missed all the steps of getting correct muscle tone. It's almost like my husband's a physical therapist and we talk about this. It's almost like if somebody had an incorrect gait, so they walk with their foot maybe turned inwards. You don't just say, turn your foot out and walk and let me watch you walk. You will do stretching, strengthening exercises of the foot, and then you'd correct the gait and you'd make sure both are corrected to avoid relapse. You wouldn't just do the muscle exercises and then say, okay, go walk. And you wouldn't just do the walking, but you do them both. And you wouldn't just tell the patient what to do. You would manually guide them there. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, if there's not proper foundational skills, you're going to probably compensate to get the muscles to do what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Overarching principle, the suctioning uh, tongue posture. Do you think that the root source of that is breastfeeding and that all of myofunctional therapy is really just an attempt to teach adults what they were supposed to learn through breastfeeding? Not all breastfeeding, but um, definitely what we're doing is we're not doing anything abnormal in myofunctional therapy. We're actually kind of fixing missed milestones of what should have been. So nursing, breastfeeding is the catalyst for good oral facial growth and development. So a correct nursing pattern is a peristaltic motion. It's kind of like this up, down, almost like a, the tongue functions like a trampoline. It depresses in the middle, which creates a vacuum of negative pressure to expel the milk. Tongue goes up a little bit forward and the milk goes down. So correct nursing, it's like myofunctional therapy, right? In infancy, it strengthens the mm -hmm. muscles correctly. If a baby's born with a tongue tie, and we'll probably want to talk about tongue tie, um, that could cause the nursing action to change. And that peristaltic motion can actually become a thrusting piston-like motion, which is already setting up the muscles incorrectly for incorrect, like kind of like a tongue thrust. So nursing is a great thing in and of itself. That's amazing. That's kind of what should occur and what starts to strengthen the muscles correctly. But if there's any other dysfunction, that could override good nursing, like tongue tie. Mm -hmm or putting babies on pacifiers or sucking pouches or overuse of bottles, or if a baby's sucking their thumb or finger, I mean, a child is, that could totally change everything. So there's not one specific thing that is going to make everything go correct. Mm -hmm. If you weren't nursed, you could still be fine. You know, if you were nursed, you still might not, you might still might have problems. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This might be a good time for me to share the screen for one sure. thing. Let's see if I can, um, show this little chart that um, kind of shows how the, hold on, give me one second. Okay. So can you see my screen, Ron? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. Your screen is live. Okay. So that is great. And then um, let's see, I'm going to make it full screen. So what I want to share with everybody, and I share this with all of my patients, is when we're looking at the cause of myofunctional disorders and airway problems, we must take into account the interacting role of the three systems, the medical system, the dental system, and the myofunctional system. These three systems work together as a team and any dysfunction or altered functional pattern in any one of these three systems can affect the others leading to problems in the oral cavity. So right now we're talking about myo, muscle, mouth, that system. And so issues like mouth breathing or incorrect rest posture, problems chewing where you only chew on one side or habits like thumb sucking, that can all affect the structures of the mouth. But also medical factors need to be taken into account like allergies, um, chronic sickness, upper respiratory infections can cause you to mouth breathe. Um, large nasal turbinates, a deviated septum, nasal polyps. If you have large adenoids, large tonsils, frenums like tongue tie, 
that can mm-hmm. all affect how mm-hmm. the muscles work, right? And then the last is the dental or the skeletal system. So if you have like a palatal torus, like a bony growth on the roof of the mouth, that could impact where the tongue rests. If you have a narrow roof of your mouth, your tongue might not be able to rest up there because it's too narrow to fit the tongue, even though the initial reason why it's narrow is probably because the tongue was low. Um, mm-hmm. If your jaws are too far back, you have an underbite or uh, upper jaw is really far forward, that can affect how your lips close and makes it more difficult for lip closure. Even appliances like night guards or certain orthodontic appliances like palatal expanders can Mm -hmm. impact the tongue's rest posture. So what we need to do for any patient is assess and treat problems in all three areas for the issue to be resolved. So when you talked about a lot of people just want expanders, well, you're just treating one circle but you must also treat the medical components and the muscular components. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, may I for a second, Nicole? Mm-hmm. So uh, can uh, let me let's go let's focus back in on that presentation. A- actually, would you mind putting it back up? Sure. So I think, and this has been my experience, that if you augment the dental component, if you just make the box bigger, then you can, to some degree, solve medical problems in myofunctional problems passively, right? Like, so if my intermolar width goes from 35 to 40 with a Marpy device, then that makes my nose, my nasal volume bigger. Uh, if my sinuses are a little bit swollen, that's okay because now the box that they're in is a little bit wider. Uh, same with tonsils and adenoids in a deviated septum that can be relieved by an expanded nasal floor. Uh, and then myofunctional system, if I'm having a hard time adopting good tongue posture and I just make my palate bigger, now I don't have to develop those fine skills of tucking the sides of my tongue up into my palate through myofunctional exercises. It just sort of goes up naturally. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, sorry. No, (laughs) no, actually. So some of these issues will be less of an issue when you do make the box bigger. So um, when you expand the palate, if you have a deviated septum, the septum doesn't straighten out. It just makes it less of an issue, right? There's more Mm -hmm. um, square footage in the nose. So Mm -hmm. allergies won't go away, but they're probably the enlargement is going to have less of an impact. You still want to treat the allergies. You might not need to have a septoplasty anymore because your nose breathing might be better, Mm -hmm. but the muscles don't know where to rest correctly if they have not been trained. Mm -hmm. So research research shows um, in children who get their tonsils and adenoids removed or get an expander or even a tongue tie release, even in adults, the tongue doesn't know, oh, now I'm going to go up lips, now I'm going to close because they've never been trained to do so. They don't just automatically do that. So that's where it's called muscular rehabilitation. After the medical cause of the mouth breathing or low tongue posture is addressed, after the skeletal or dental issues are addressed, muscles must be rehabilitated. And it's not always after, but we have to rehabilitate muscles as part of the process. Um, If somebody can't breathe through their nose due to enlarged tonsils or um, enlarged adenoids, then first you need to address the medical cause of the mouth breathing before you rehabilitate the muscles, but the muscles must be rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, a lot of viewers of my channel probably feel like they're um, doing a lot of self-teaching of myofunctional stuff through mewing videos on YouTube, Mm -hmm. but my experience with that is that there's that the mewing instruction that you get on the internet is not correct in that most people would be served by having a personal trainer of their myofunctional system which is is that that's basically where you come in as a myofunctional therapist is that right yeah people people say that kind of like a personal trainer or kind of funny do you want me to keep the screen share up or do you want me to close it I'm able to go in and out of it, so it's up to you. Um, okay, I'm, well, I can't see you when it's up, so I'm going to yeah. close it, and then we can easily go back just because I I feel funny when I can't see yep. you. Okay. Perfect. Um, so uh, I've been called the, the quarterback of the team. Most myofunctional therapists are like the quarterback because when we work with our patients, we typically see them once a week, whether we're doing virtual or in office, once a week for like an active phase of therapy, 
maybe two to three months. And then we might see them on a monthly basis for like a year because muscles take time to change and new functions and patterns, especially as an adult, you know, you've chewed and swallowed a certain way your whole life. And it takes a while for that to permanently change. So we're kind of like a quarterback to the team because we're that connecting source between dentist, orthodontist, ear, nose, and throat doctor, allergy doctor. Um, we're kind of that quarterback. So you can think of us as like a personal trainer and slash quarterback um, helping on that team. But what's probably most important is the evaluation. Because if you don't find out why your tongue is resting low, why you're mouth breathing, then you can do all the exercises you want on YouTube, but you're probably never going to fully resolve the issue. And it's not like a cookie cutter set of exercises. It has to be tailored to what your specific problems are. Perhaps things might get better, but um, you could you could click your tongue up all you want. But if you have a tongue tie that's impacting your ability for your tongue to rest correctly on the roof of the mouth, then it's never going to carry over unconsciously when you're sleeping. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is tongue tie the 600 pound gorilla in the room when it comes to making myofunctional progress? Mm -hmm. So we call it like a restricted lingual frenum or a tongue tie. It's one of the most, if not the number one most significant contributing factor to tongue dysfunction from a myofunctional perspective. Why is that? Well, that tissue develops in utero. So when the baby's born, they're born that way. And that tissue is not elastic. It does not stretch or grow longer. Some people might think it does. It does not. It's not an elastic tissue. So that can actually pull the tongue down. So our normal rest posture is the entire tongue sucked up, not just front. Some people think their tongue's up and it's just the tip of the tongue. I always question when I ask my patients at the evaluation, where does your tongue rest? If they say up, I then back up and I say, okay, the tip of your tongue, now the middle, now the back. Almost every case, tip is up, middle, and back are down or floating in the middle. Mm -hmm. So you always want to question. Is that, because they're, is that because they're pressing and they're not suctioning? Could be. Is it possible to suction only the front of the tongue onto the roof of the mouth? No, probably not. You're probably not just really, right? tip up or holding the tip up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's like... It's like the analogy you use. It's like the thing in the in the shower that holds up your loofah, the suction cup, mm -hmm. where if if the back half of that thing is peeled off, it's not going to stick at all. It's either all stuck on there or none of it's stuck yeah, on exactly. there. Yeah, right? exactly. Do this exactly. Do this fun thing right now. Suck your tongue up like, like you're going to do a click, but hold that. Okay, hold that suction and try to breathe through your mouth. Do open your mouth mm -hmm, and try to breathe through your mouth. <laughs> Impossible. Okay. Right. If now, I have lingual, I have lingual braces on, by the way, so it's hard for me to ooh, suck. Okay. <laughs> You're like ripping yeah. your tongue up. Now, <laughs> rip your tongue up and open your mouth and try to breathe through your mouth, just with the tip of your tongue. Just you the can. tip. Yeah, yeah. It's a easy test. Your tongue is like a respiratory muscle, a breathing muscle. It's an organ that can seal off the airflow between the nasal and the oral cavities. Your mm. tongue suction, front, middle, and back can stop the air from going through your mouth, which is really important when we think about airway collapsibility during sleep, body posture, breathing throughout the day and at night. Um, wow. So that, what you just taught us actually is incredibly, incredibly profound if, if you think about it. If you're doing correct tongue posture, it's impossible to breathe from your mouth. Exactly. Yep. That's like, mm -hmm. that's mind-blowing stuff. Yep. I, that had never occurred to me. Right. Think about all this. Patients who use a CPAP, and if the mask is on their nose, if their tongue's not sucked up, air's going to leak right out of their mouth, okay? It just blows their nose out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. um, think about, you know, athletes. If you're running, you're, if the back of the tongue, middle and back, are not sucked up, the air is going to come right through your nose, right into your mouth. Now, the suction of the tongue will help the jaws come closer together so your lips can close easier. Mm -hmm. If your tongue is low, the tongue has enough weight to drop the mandible and cause the lips to open. Mm -hmm. So correct tongue posture helps lips stay closed. Mm -hmm. Low tongue posture will help lead to your mouth opening. Okay, but think about it on the reverse also. If your lips are closed, that will help your tongue stay up because it'll bring your jaws closer together too. If your lips are open, your tongue cannot maintain suction on the roof of the mouth. 
Mm-hmm. If so if you like kind of open your lips, suck your tongue up, it's going to drop. It's going to lose that suction. So there's a bi-directional relationship with lips and tongue. So we don't just treat one or the other, but if there's open mouth posture or mouth breathing, we need to treat the lips and the tongue. Mm-hmm. But when we talk about tongue tie, we're talking about that a little bit. Um, that tissue is not elastic and that can pull the tongue down. Now, if someone has like an anterior tongue tie, anybody would recognize that. Any any person would say, what? The tongue is stuck, right? The tip of the front tongue. Front of the tongue. Front, yeah. anterior, yeah. front of the tongue, right? Most people will catch that even in infancy, but I'm going to tell you, we get patients where you're just like boggled that nobody told them their tongue is stuck at the front and they have a lot of orthodontic problems and eating problems and uh, speech issues potentially. But I don't know. Have you heard of the word posterior tongue tie? I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can Mm -hmm. confuse people a lot and we don't need to go into super detail about it, but we talked about tongue posture, front, middle, back needs to be sucked up. Well, sometimes the tip of the tongue is not tethered down, but the middle and the back of the tongue are pulled down from the tongue tie. How can we, how can we uh, test for that in ourselves? So that's where a myofunctional therapist will evaluate for that or someone who has training. There's specific protocols of how to evaluate for tongue tie. And some dentist or orthodontist or pediatricians, do- ear, nose, and throat doctors will miss that. Because if you're not trained in how to assess for how it's affecting functioning and rest posture, then um, you might miss that. So there's a specific protocol. So we'll have a patient open their mouth. Uh, N- Nicole, could we uh, maybe like evaluate me for that? Just as, a, as an example, would you be comfortable doing yeah, and that? Have you ever had a tongue tie release before? I did. I had a tongue tie release in 2017. Um, not sure. Sh- I, I think I, it, I had a good result, but I by no means think I have a perfectly released tongue because I know that when I, the uh, TRMR, my oh, T- that's, that's TRMR right. is probably, I don't know, you can tell me, but I would say it's like 70%. So I know my tongue is by no means perfect. Mm-hmm. But as far as my posterior tongue tethering, that's where I'm a lot less clear because I know that my release was definitely right up front with the laser and that nothing was really done on the back sides. So it's not the back sides. So what can okay. be confusing is when you think of posterior, you might think like way back. Um, it's still the front, not the side. So we all have that string of tissue. Mine, I have my tongue tie release. Um, and it can be laser, it can be scissors. It's not the tool, but more the technique of the provider to know to release back enough. So not just like a little snip in the front, but you want to release it enough. So that string of tissue far enough back where it's going to allow the middle and the back of the tongue to go up. And we'll look at yours in a second. Sure. But what we do is we never refer for a tongue tie release right off the bat if the tissue appears to be short or tight. We always have to do myofunctional therapy exercises first to strengthen and tone the muscles so they're prepared for a release. And then we do rehabilitation after. So it's um, very rare or atypical to ever say like you have a tongue tie or if a dentist notices that and just to release it because the goal of releasing it is to get correct oral rest posture and chewing and swallowing. It's not like a means to an end procedure. So it needs work before and work after. So we use the TRMR as one factor to evaluate. We don't really care on tongue protrusion. So like sticking the tongue out, um, a dentist might care on like range of motion to clean, well, clean the back teeth, things like that. But what mm. we care about is can the middle and back portions of the tongue rest sucked up easily? So I might have a patient stick the tongue out. So you might go ahead and stick your tongue out. You might have to come closer to the screen too, so I can see it really well, but I'm going to have you stick your tongue and try to stick out and not have it touch your teeth. Okay, good. And then you can bring it back in and relax. And I might have you come like really close to the screen to help me see it better. But what I might look for is, is there a dip? like a cup or a bowl shape in the front or middle of the tongue when you stick it out. If there is, that my brain starts thinking, okay, there is something underneath the tongue pulling it. If not, it doesn't matter. If there's a heart shape in the front of the tongue, that's uh, usually it's restricted. You don't have that. I think I see a little scalloping marks on the sides of your tongue though, right? Oh yeah. I always have scalloping. I'm okay. always, yeah. You're scalloping. Looking for, yeah. <laughs> yep. I, and um, always looking for more space. Yeah. But maybe it's just poor myofunctional habits. And by the way, um, one thing I would like is if maybe at the end of this call or during the call, 
if you see me having any compensations or poor habits myself, let me know. Cause I think, I think that a lot of my viewers would be surprised at how common and how subtle compensations can be. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that I have them. Um, I often see them in myself, even like when I swallow, I'll, I'll use my whole neck or all my cheeks and, um, I have a hard time isolating. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, just, if you see something, please let me know. And by the way, too, I had maxillary skeletal expansion, um, bit over a year ago. So I'm still, I have the gap that's still getting, I closed. saw that, but I'm yeah. not wearing my Invisalign. It, it was, uh, I don't know, 10 millimeters wide before we don't need Damn. to show photos of that. I had a huge gap. Um, and so it's still getting closed there. Um, and I have Invisalign I'm not wearing right now. So I notice I have a lot of jaw compensation. So when I watch myself, I'm a jaw surgery candidate as well for like MMA surgery. I had retractive orthodontics as a child, headgear for class two. So my um, upper jaw was really far forward and they just pushed everything back. And so I discovered I had upper airway resistance syndrome, which is like sleep apnea, but your oxygen doesn't drop. So you're kind of running a race all throughout the night as your airway starts to collapse, heart rate goes up. Um, Cortisol goes up, high sympathetic tone. So your um, sort of fight or flight or nocturnal stress. So mm -hmm. I discovered I had that when I was um, probably about oh, maybe 38. Um, and then I went on a CPAP for two years as I searched the world, basically interviewing orthodontists to see what kind of treatment <laughs> I want. And I ended up getting the MSC. Um, and that was uh, definitely over a year ago. So now I'm in the phase where we're... Um, Uprighting my teeth in the bone with the Invisalign, mm -hmm. I still have the gap. But technically, I probably could benefit from just bringing everything more forward. Couldn't we all? <laughs> right? That's everybody just, we just need jaw surgery. Um, but I definitely had major significant changes in my breathing, my sleep quality, uh, you know, daytime mood, just how I felt after the expansion, mm -hmm. um, for sure. So that's why my teeth are messed up. <laughs> it looks like you have a really great result, though. I mean, your face is looking really good and symmetric, and uh, your cheekbones are are quite aesthetic. If I, I could say so. Noticed. So I had quarter punctures, mm -hmm. which is where they drill the holes along the palate to help the suture split. Um, for a female, I think I was forty when I had that. For, no, I was probably forty-two. Um, and the suture did split. Now my orthodontist uses uh, corticotomy where he actually does the piezo. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with that? I am quite familiar with it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think you interviewed my orthodontist a few times. Dr. Ting is my orthodontist. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I just had him on last week. Okay. I just went to his course on Friday. He does a great course on MSC, FME, um, Marpy. And so he now uses the piezo um, to open the suture and... Um, immediately with the court economy and the MSC turns, I started feeling like my nose opened up and I was not a mouth breather. This is what's really interesting. And you might've had a similar experience. We could talk about that, but I felt like someone sprayed like Afrin in my nose and it just like opened up and I wanted more. And I kept turning that. Well, I turned it on the protocol, of course, but I think I did once eat. a day. Yeah. I think it was once a day. He does slow turns. Yeah. Um, the suture took like it took like 30 some turns to finally split. So we're getting to a point where if it didn't split, I would need surgical cyst and I'm afraid of surgery. I was like, no, please. So I started like chewing really hard carrots with my front teeth and love crunch cereal. It's a granola cereal. That's really, I was like, I'm going to just crunch on the crunchiest things just to make that suture split. So I think I learned about you then because I looked up online. I saw your videos about MSC. I was like, wait, <laughs> so, so it was funny. So, um, I felt like a twinge between my front teeth and that's when the suture split. I probably had two turns left before we were going to give up. And, wow. um, and I just felt like I could breathe so much better through my nose and I'm a mm. runner and I could run longer distances, um, less, less discomfort. Like I enjoyed mm. running versus like, Oh man, I have to go run five miles today. You know, it was mm. like a, something that I actually looked forward to. I found a lot of changes, uh, headaches gone. I had chronic headaches. Um, wow. 
a lot of issues with my breathing changed. And I had a sleep study before the MSC in a lab where they actually stick a catheter in the nose down the throat to measure negative pressure in your airway. So it's like the most accurate gold standard for diagnosing upper airway resistance syndrome. It's called a PEZ. Have you heard of that before? No, I've heard of a DICE, but not a PEZ. So a DICE is a sleep study where they actually put you to sleep. And it's not a sleep study. It's an um, airway study where they put you to sleep. Mm. And they do um, the nasal, um, like a video through the nose and ENT to see where the airway is collapsing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what I did is a regular sleep study, like an overnight sleep study in a lab. But part of that sleep study, not only hooking up the EEG monitors and the chest monitors and oxygen monitor, um, but they also check negative pressure in your airway through this special catheter that goes in the nose and you kind of like swallow it. It's kind of a weird thing, but it actually checks how much harder you're working to breathe. And as you work harder to breathe, what happens in your brain? Does your brain arouse? So most sleep studies in regular labs that don't do this will only pick up on like oxygen drops. Um, but this will look at like, you know, kind of like young fit females or males who are not o overweight, that population that's not really having oxygen dropping mm -hmm. tend to get missed on sleep studies because they're not looking at those subtleties and they might not be looking at all. They might say, oh, you had so many brain arousals in your sleep, but we don't know why it was spontaneous. Well, really oftentimes it's actually airway. You're working hard to breathe. Your adrenaline shoots up, your brain arouses, but your oxygen might not drop. So mm -hmm. this is called upper airway resistance syndrome. So I had that very detailed sleep study beef. Well, I had it once here in San Diego without the, the monitor. And I had like, I don't know, tons of brain arousals all night. And they said they were spontaneous arousals. My HI or my sleep score was zero. We don't know why you just need cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And I said, geez, I don't have insomnia. I could literally fall asleep right now if you turn out the lights. Like, I don't have insomnia. Um, it was weird. Like, I'm always moving around, going to the gym, working out, doing everything. Because probably if I stop, I'll, like, fall asleep or something, I guess. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was actually excited that I didn't have sleep apnea or any issues until I heard a lecture by a famous neurologist who's a sleep physician. You should have him on. His name is Dr. Gerald Simmons. And he's in Texas. And he is specializes in upper airway resistance syndrome for all people like me who get missed, who just think, oh, we're moody and we have headaches. Mm -hmm. um, he can really see what's going on when you sleep when other sleep studies might miss this. So I flew to his lab in Texas and I did the PEZ sleep study. So same type of sleep study, but they put that catheter, that monitor. And he found out my HI was actually 24. So 24 times an hour, my breathing, I was struggling to breathe at night basically. And my RDI or respiratory distress index. So the amount of times my brain woke up because I worked harder to breathe was 36 times an hour. So every two minutes, my brain, because they, you know, check was waking up out of a sleep cycle. Of mm -hmm. course, I'm going to have headaches. Of course, you're going to have like facial pain, clenching your jaws to like stabilize your jaw and you're going to be tired and moody and you know, whatever other issues occur with that. So I um, got another sleep study after the MSC. I still had it in. Um, so it'll push your tongue down, right? But I, I sure. another sleep study. And my score went from 24 events per hour down to six just with wow. MSC, nothing wow. else. And it was still in. So if I did another sleep study with it removed and with the myofunctional therapy hitting that hard, it probably would be way lower. Mm -hmm. It went mm -hmm. from abnormal to just slightly mild, just from expanding the palate. That's incredible. What a testimony. So I just went on and on and on about me and that. No, that that's an, Hey, that's an incredible testimony. Most of the people watching this video are considering Marpy in one form or another. And I'm sure that, you know, and like you, a lot of them have gotten false negatives from sleep studies. It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. I can't tell you how many people sign up to speak with me and they tell me they've done a sleep study and it came out negative and I'm looking at them and they're telling me they're chronically fatigued and they obviously have small jaws. And, and I say to them, okay, you're definitely on the spectrum somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, you may not be past that threshold where the insurance company calls it sleep apnea and they're willing to pay for therapies for you, but you're, it's not black and white. It's not a switch on off it. And 
So, but it's very interesting to learn about the plumbing behind what's what's causing these uh, false negatives in sleep right. studies. Is there so? Would you recommend this? Is there any way to get this PEZ sleep study apart from with Dr. Simmons in Texas? There, there might be like less than twenty labs across the country that use the PEZ monitor. And there might be other ways to pick up on this with like a watch pad, which is not a true like sleep study in a lab where you're, you're using sensors on the brain, but that mm. can kind of assume um, autonomic nervous system arousal. So you can kind of see those things from that. Um, I don't know. I know Stanford used to use a PEZ. I don't think they use that anymore. But I think the point being um, when you have symptoms and a lot of these airway issues, it's due to malocclusion decreased space in the mouth. We're basically choking ourselves in our sleep. You can mm. look at a facial structure. You can do sleep questionnaires and ask questions. And we pretty much know <laughs> we're like, okay, you can, you're not sleeping well. But yeah, when you get a false negative, it's really upsetting. And what most sleep labs are doing is they're not scoring these issues, brain arousals as events. If the oxygen doesn't drop a certain percent below the person's baseline, and that rule was developed in like, I think it was in 2012, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine changed their guidelines for sleep labs and said, we want you to score events if the oxygen drops or there's a brain arousal. And it was too much work for the labs to do this. And they were worried they're going to lose their accreditation if they're not, because you actually have to really look in detail on the sleep study raw data and someone needs to be really counting everything. And it's really a lot of work. So sleep labs kind of got upset, I guess, and rebelled. And the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, have, they have two guidelines, actually, for sleep study scoring. There's a rule 1A, that's the recommended rule, that there needs to be a drop in oxygen or no drop in oxygen, but a brain arousal. And that can be counted as an event. Mm -hmm. But rule 1B is the accepted rule, not recommended, but they'll accept that rule also. And that's the Medicare rule that there needs to be a 4% drop in oxygen to score an event as an event. So mm -hmm. most labs are using rule 1B and they're mm -hmm. ignoring the fact that a lot of us younger people who are not elderly and obese, who are not literally gasping for air all throughout the night, who might not even be snoring, are not having oxygen drops. Our brains are so hyper reactive to our ability or lack of ability to um, breathe easily. So as the airway kind of collapses, your brain arouses right away before your body has time for the oxygen to drop. So those are gonna be the people who are, um, you know, narrow jaws, retruded jaws, scalloping on the tongue, um, who are, you know, maybe baggy eyes, venous pooling, kind of like flattened cheekbones. There's all different facial characteristics, but the daytime characteristics are gonna maybe be fibromyalgia, or fatigue, excessive sleepiness, or maybe they're not sleepy, they're just fatigued. You just mm -hmm. feel like crap, <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. exhausted. Um, or anxiety or depression, because imagine if you're running a race all night in your sleep, your, um, your autonomic nervous system is dysregulated. So your fight or flight is just hyperactive. And at nighttime is when everything should calm and you should restore. And if your heart is your heart rate increasing all throughout the night, during the day, you're going to have maybe panic attacks. You're going to be stressed out, anxious. Maybe you're going to be depressed. So there's all those social, socio-emotional symptoms that you might feel, um, headaches or migraines um, or headaches from either clenching the jaw or from the brain that arouses all throughout the night. There's all different signs and symptoms that those people may have, and they may score fine on a sleep study because it wasn't scored with maybe the recommended rule or their, the PEZ monitor will, will clearly pick up on that. So probably like asking Dr. Simmons what other labs he knows that uses that. There might be some in New York. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's around the country, there's a few. And the reason I think a lot of labs don't use that is it's just a little bit harder to do. It's more mm -hmm. for the technician. Um, but from my personal experience, I was able to see, okay, wow. I just thought maybe my first sleep study, I just thought, okay, I'm just, you know, I'm a person that gets headaches a lot. And I'm, you know, maybe you have a lot of anxiety. It's just how I was born until mm -hmm. I realized, oh, I'm not sleeping well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think is optimal sleep position? 
So if you have an airway problem, sleeping flat on your back is going to make it worse most likely because gravity, right? If we want your tongue to be up and you're laying flat on your back, all the muscles and soft tissues relax. Mm -hmm. However, if you are doing myofunctional therapy um, or not, on your back but elevated about 25 degrees up is what I recommend. We want to tip the head of the bed up so the upper body, so the head is in line with the neck and the thoracic spine to help prevent reflux and to help facilitate better tongue posture. So I tell my patients sleep on your back with your head tipped up. So I have a sleep number bed. I sleep up pretty propped up pretty high due to my airway issues, um, which are better, but still there's like residual. Um, so most people don't have sleep number beds. So I just say, grab your mattress, shove a pillow under the mattress. So the upper part of your body is tipped upwards. Mm -hmm. Then you can put a pillow under your head. There used to be a pillow called the face saver pillow, which I loved. I have like three of them. I take them like wherever I go. If I'm traveling, I'm like, I need my pillow. It was like a, almost like an airplane pillow. That's kind of a comma or a crescent shape that would go under the neck. Now that they stopped making that and I'm finding, trying to find something similar, but kind of a little bit of neck support to put a little bit of comfortable hyperextension because that CPR position helps open up the airway. So I right, on back, right. head tipped up, pillow, pillow to support the neck. Sleeping on your side is good as well, but we don't want anyone to sleep on their stomach. That's gonna put pressure on the TMJ, could actually change uh, the inclination of the teeth, the jaw, and also you can't get a good full inhalation with all your body weight on your stomach and your lungs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. never sleep on your stomach is what I recommend. Sleep on your back with your upper body tipped up or on your side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. I'm, I'm not Muslim, but in the Quran, there's actually a, a, a rule that you should never sleep on your stomach. Oh, see, <laughs> a lot of interesting things. Like even in like, um, Asian medicine or yoga or things like that, tongue up, tongue tip up, tongue sucked up, you know, in yoga postures, meditative postures, mm -hmm. there's something to that, right? So it's interesting. What do you think about, uh, so by the way, I also have been advocating incline bed therapy for a long time on my channel. I okay. recommend people just take their whole bed frame and put spacers uh, underneath the legs of the bed at the head of the bed to get it up six to nine inches, you know, mm -hmm. the more the merrier because of the relief that that puts on the airway just by Definitely. changing the angle of the gravitational force. Um, what do you think about sleeping on your back with your head to the side? Because a lot of people, when they sleep on their side, they end up on their back. I used to recommend to people to wear a backpack with like basketballs in it to prevent from rolling back on your back. Um, but for some reason, the body wants to be on its back for a lot of people, including myself. So what I've been doing recently, I'd love to hear your thoughts, incline bed, no pillow on my back, but I open up to one side a little bit with my hips, both shoulders still on the bed. And then I turn my head to the side. So it's like the best of both worlds where like you're on your back, but your head is to the side. So your tongue isn't falling back into your throat. Yeah, I don't know too much about the difference. I have to like ask a physical therapist also like neck, how is that position? You know, what is that straining? I know some physical therapists recommend like tipped up and then putting a pillow between the knees on your side. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. face saver pillow, pillow I got to show you. Um, I screen share with my patients and I can't believe they don't have it anymore. So I have to figure out, but that kind of does that neck up. Maybe what you're getting when you pivot that way. Um, is maybe you're kind of opening your airway up slightly. Also, potentially, people shift to their sides due to breathing and airflow through the nose. So mm -hmm. if you have a deviated septum or um, you know chronic congestion on one side or something, you might have to be switching to a certain side to help you breathe, breathe better through your nose. So mm -hmm. your body might be doing something on purpose. <laughs> it's doing that because it needs to. So I don't necessarily see anything wrong with that, but I do like the tipping the bed, head of the bed up, providing mm -hmm. some neck support. And mm -hmm. definitely flat on the back is not good. It's mm -hmm. people, even if you get a sleep study, it's usually when you're supine, your score is a lot worse. Um, do you think that the natural sleep position is on flat, like inclined on your back, but facing straight up? Like if we all had caveman jaws, is the body capable of sleeping face up flat or, without inclined or with it inclined? What, no inclined because I don't 
One observation I've made on my channel is that flat surfaces are not common in nature. Like if you go hiking on the Appalachian Trail and you're getting ready to pitch your tent at night, it's actually really hard to find flat ground to set your tent up on. Yeah. So I don't even think that sleeping on flat ground is natural at all. I think when we were hunters and gatherers, we were we were always on an incline. It's just a question of whether the head is up or the head is down. And it's obviously going to be head up. We just know that intuitively to sleep with our head on the high side of the hill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so no, sleeping on an incline, head up on the high side of the incline, mm -hmm. but just boom, face up. Do you think- That's what that I do. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Hopefully nothing's wrong with that because <laughs> that's totally what I do with the pillow like that. With I, the pillow. Okay. Okay up inclined i incline pretty high and i have patients who we it's there's no method there's no one answer there's not a this degree of inclination this amount of inches it's like find what's comfortable for you and your body because if you incline too much then you slide down which mm -hmm. i've done that and i'm like oh now i'm on the flat part so it was up too high if it's down too low, I'm like, oh, I don't, I didn't sleep well last night. I could just tell. So you mm. want to find what's comfortable. And I sleep flat on my back, incline. So I shouldn't say flat, but on my back, incline with my head tipped up with my face saver pillow like that. Mm -hmm. and, and you're suctioned onto the yeah. roof of your mouth? My lips stay closed all night. Yep. And uh, that's really the key to sleeping uh, with your airway open is the suction, isn't it? Help maintaining that tongue up on the roof of the mouth. So some people say, well, you're asleep. How does your tongue stay up? So it's that daytime training, but mm -hmm. there's, um, when we sleep, our muscles drop in tone, but they're not floppy. We're not like this floppy system. Our airway muscles maintain tone. Our tongue maintains a resting tone. So in myofunctional therapy, we increase the resting tone of the tongue. So it's more likely to stay up while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the tongue is up front, middle, back. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's not, I'm probably going to wake up. Maybe there's going to be snoring. I don't usually snore, but um, you might wake up, your tongue's dropped. Maybe your airway's cut off. You might have like your heart pounding or you kind of like a gasp for air or toss or turn or something like that. But yeah, ultimately ideal position is the entire tongue is up and lips are closed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you comment uh, on what it's been like for you to grow into that new space that you've gotten with the MSE and some of the myofunctional training that you've done with yourself to, uh, get, get grown into that new face? Yeah. So, um, I, it was interesting to go through the experience because now I can really help guide patients. I just had a patient I was talking to yesterday who's an MSE. And at first there's, depending on the type of expander, but MSE has bars that hook onto the molars and connect to the appliance, right? Metal bars. It's really hard to get your tongue sucked up with that. Mm -hmm. Um, the tongue, it can't hold the suction and you have this huge metal thing. But if you've done myofunctional therapy before, it's going to be up. It's just going to be more difficult and it's going to be pressed on the appliance. You're going to have like these like marks from the appliance. When the arms get cut off, which is usually when the suture splits, they'll cut the arms off. So you just have the middle part of the appliance. The MSC is really nice because it's pretty flat on the palate. It's there, but it's pretty flat. So you can get suction around the appliance. So once those arms are off, you can get the sides of the tongue up and you'll kind of have indentations, but you can do your exercises and you can rest with your tongue up on the appliance. Mm -hmm. When the appliance is removed, the tongue is like, oh, my space, it's back. So um, you don't have that appliance like kind of pushing it down. So I felt like that was kind of my process of oral rest posture with that appliance in. I just had a patient yesterday who her tongue was like getting stuck on the bars on the sides. It's really uncomfortable and her suture already split. So she was consulting with her orthodontist when he's going to cut off the bars. And I said, don't worry, just keep doing everything you're supposed to do with your myofunctional therapy exercise. It's only going to get easier. And then mm -hmm. when the lines are moved, it's only going to get easier. So not to worry. Um, so that's kind of what I noticed also with Invisalign or anything that goes between the occlusal surface of the teeth, the biting surface, Invisalign or aligners, they're really thin, right? You'd think, oh, they're fine. That actually increasing the dental freeway space, the space between the upper and lower jaws can actually make it more difficult to keep your lips closed during the day, but especially when sleeping. Huh. So what happens, remember I said when your mouth opens, your tongue drops. Mm -hmm. So when the jaws open slightly from that 
that dental free space, just from that little bit of acrylic, that can make the tongue drop and the lips open. So most of my patients who are wearing Invisalign or clear retainers, I have them use lip tape to help support the lips staying closed when they sleep because mm. they're more likely to open when they sleep. So that's another thing I noticed in this process is um, it's a little bit harder to make sure your lips are closed when sleeping with the Invisalign in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Inv Invisalign is brutal for that reason. I think it, uh, my experience with it is that I also clench more when I'm wearing Invisalign because of that added space, that added mass between the teeth. Definitely. I definitely felt that with myself. I had bite turbos on my Invisalign at one point and MA tap, so mandibular advancement wings to bring the mandible forward. And mm. that was brutal when I slept. I told my orthodontist, I said, my lower jaw is totally falling back when I sleep and it's you know, functionally it's worse at night. So they put little attachments to hold the lower jaw forward because when you sleep, your muscles do drop in tone and the lower jaw drops back. So I actually felt like I got my cheekbones expanded a lot with the MSE. Um, and then I started clenching my teeth when I got the aligners and I felt like I developed all this like muscular compensation and it erased like <laughs> this really nice look because I got like really strong muscles here that mm. didn't look so good, the master. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a process as you work through that until you're done with the treatment and things can kind of settle. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that Invisalign is sort of, people think of it as this ultra minimalist orthodontic therapy, but in my experience, it's the opposite. It's the most invasive, dare I say, because first of all, it's not that invisible if you have attachments, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're actually kind of uglier than braces. I can see them. <laughs> I can't, I didn't even know you had them. So, hey, shit, maybe I'm wrong <laughs> because I didn't even oh, notice yeah. you had attachments. Yeah. But in real life, they're quite visible. You can see them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And then um, having something between the bite plane is really disruptive to the whole functioning of everything. So ironically, regular braces can actually be the most minimalist orthodontic thing you can do because it allows you to suction, doesn't put anything between your teeth. It's just ugly as sin. Yeah, we. I do tell patients if they weren't a mouth breather and they got braces, I still like them to just use a single line of tape once they've been cleared mm. in myofunctional therapy to be able to do that. Um, because even um, the braces in front of the teeth can make the lips want to open more. It's harder to close mm. the lips with braces. But yeah, definitely adding something on the biting surface between the upper and lower teeth, it does make it harder to rest correctly. Um, so I, I definitely feel that as I'm in this process of my treatment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just to bring it back to your own treatment, if you're willing to talk about it, you mentioned that you'd considered jaw surgery. Um, by the way, shout out, is that your channel, um, Airway Circle? So Airway Circle is a group which is amazing. So Renata Nami is the in charge of that. She started the Airway Circle, and I do a podcast for them called Airway Answers, Expanding Your Breath of Knowledge. It's supposed to be expanding, right? Like we get it, right? Expanding your breath of knowledge um, that. in that kind of <laughs> funny way. Um, and so I interview different like dentists and orthodontists about these treatments. So Airway Circle, go to their website and they have a membership and they have all different um, free webinars. They do trainings and things like that as well. You learn. Well, you did this amazing interview with Dr. Gunson, the surgeon four yeah. weeks ago. It's an hour and a half. I started it. Um, the first 12 minutes of that interview, I was like, oh my God, it's Dr. Gunson. And he, like, I'm hearing his thoughts and he's brilliant. And like, these are so, these, all these insights are golden nuggets. I'm going to link to that interview in the description of this video. Um, but you discussed with Dr. Gunson your own uh, kind of thoughts about surgery, how you've been, re it's your biggest fear, you said. Mm -hmm. After MSE and the gains that you've gotten from MSE, do you feel like you can live like this? Are you stable for a while? Or now that you've gotten some, do you want more? And are you just imagining <laughs> what it would be like to have a centimeter of advancement or something like that? Right, you get greedy, you just want more. So it's funny because I turned my MSC, I think it was like 82 turns. And then it wouldn't turn anymore. And Dr. Ting's like, stop, Nicole, you're going to break the MSD. I was like, don't turn anymore. So I actually maxed it out. I think it was a 12 millimeter one. Um, and you kind of want more, right? So I felt like I got really good expansion. I could breathe better. My tongue used to be crammed in the back of my throat. 
I could see on the CBCT, so those x-ray images, my tongue is up, but it's just pushed back into my throat. When you got, when I got expanded, the tongue can actually come up and forward. So although you're getting horizontal or transverse growth, it was a little bit of front back, like my, my tongue could come forward also, right? So MSC is not forward, sagittal, AP growth. It's just widening in this direction. But I did feel like soft tissue wise, I got a little bit of forward growth. So I feel like my jaws want to be forward more because of course they do. I had like a retractive treatment as a child. So there was already a problem. And then we just pushed everything back. And I feel like everything should go forward. Dr. Ting is like, just get jaw surgery already. But physically, um, I, I don't have chronic headaches anymore. I used to have chronic headache. When I was on the CPAP, it went away. That's Dr. Simmons, the sleep physician, told me just try this CPAP to see if your issues are airway related. And they were because it went away completely. I would wake up mm. with my stomach aches from reflux, but I didn't know why. But I'd be like, oh, man, I have a stomach ache every morning. That completely went away because you get reflux when you have poor breathing at night. Yeah, why? Can you explain that? Is it because you're swallowing air? No. Mm -mm. So um, it's what happens is in a tube. So if you think of your nose down your throat as like your breathing tube, any narrowing in any part of that tube, I usually, I don't have it next to me, but I have a straw. I show my patients like a straw. I, I hold it there. Any narrowing in any part of that tube is going to cause the air to rush faster through the narrow part to get to your lungs. So if you have a deviated septum or in the nose, you may have, um, enlarged nasal turbinates or congestion, or in the throat, you might have large tonsils or large adenoids at the back of the nose, or a narrow palate is a narrowing in the breathing tube or a low tongue. If your tongue's low and back, that's narrowing your breathing tube, right? Any narrowing in any part, what happens to the air? It has to flow quicker through that more narrow part. And that quickened flow of air causes negative pressure in the airway. It's called the Bernoulli effect. It's like a mm -hmm. physics law of airflow. Well, negative pressure causes the sidewalls of the airway to collapse or suck inwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happens there is now that negative pressure actually causes you to suck up stomach acid and gases. So you are physically sucking up or refluxing into your throat, into this, even the nose. You can wake up. If you go to sleep fine and you wake up with congestion in the morning, that is a telltale sign of obstructed breathing at night. Mm -hmm. And then I actually went away. My son, when he was eight, he got MSC also. We went in together and he no longer wakes up with morning congestion after the MSC. Um, so you can actually, that reflux causes inflammation in the airway of the throat, the back of the nose, and that mm -hmm. causes the airway to get smaller as well because it's inflamed. So it's a sort of vicious cycle. So reflux, when you're sleeping, is oftentimes correlated to poor breathing from a reduced airway size, causing you to create this vacuum of negative pressure, sucking up stomach acid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's basically like putting a plunger on your throat and <laughs> sucking up stuff that's exactly. supposed to be down. Exactly. Oh man, that's, that's another one of these, you know, effects of having a small airway that people would never consider, but it's just so devastating. Yeah. And sometimes you don't realize you have reflux. And I didn't even know that that's what it was. I'm like, oh, I have this weird stomach ache every morning. When I stand up and walk around, it kind of goes away. Um, I don't know why. That went away completely when I was on CPAP and then I stopped and did the MSC. And I rarely get that. But if I'm too flat on my back, some of these symptoms come back. So you ask like permanent changes. I feel like I have better breathing, better sleep, less symptoms of like headaches or anxiety during the day, things like that. Um, but the airway is still vulnerable. If I maybe drink a couple too many drinks, um, if I am too flat on my back, if I eat a heavy meal too close to bed, things like that, it's still susceptible. And I feel like comfort wise, I would love to just have everything brought forward. Like Dr. Mm. Gunson, we talked about in that interview. Um, it's just, I don't know. <laughs> would it be with Dr. Gunson? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I haven't even investigated if I would ever really have MMA surgery, but I hear, you know, from so many patients who have that it's life changing. I mean, people are able to get taken off of blood pressure medication like that night, the first night I've heard this multiple times, 
that first night of sleep, these patients feel like they've breathed better than they have their entire life because it's all structural. It's anatomical. Sleep disordered breathing is an anatomical illness. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah, of course. You mean the first night after surgery where they're like coughing up blood and they're still yeah, super I don't swollen? Think coughing up blood. Um, that would probably be bad. But I, um, yeah. Thank you for correcting me on that. See, it just goes to show there's so much negative perception about what, how, how miserable and terrible jaw surgery is. And, and I think it's probably not as bad as we all think. You know, people even say it's actually not even that painful. Um, so it's, you know, you're swollen and there's a, rec a long recovery period, but it's life changing for those people who are really having health related issues um, or, you know, daytime related issues or on blood pressure medication or there's so many, so many health consequences to untreated sleep disorder breathing. And it doesn't have to be apnea. We talked about that, um, that it's, it's life changing. And so, yeah, people say, that first night, it's almost like you take a, a airway the size of a, a cocktail straw and you've mm -hmm. just made it a garden hose. You've oh moved gosh. all the structure. They can breathe again or breathe mm -hmm. like they've never breathed before. It's, yeah, it's really interesting. Dr. Bill Hang, are you familiar with him? I met him in 2014. He was my first orthodontic consult back when I started on all this. Yeah. So I'm, I haven't spoken with him in nine years, but I'm, I know him. Yeah. Yeah. He does a lot of lectures on this and, shows different patients who are just like, I first night, what I, I know he lectures on one patient who probably within a few days or a week was able to be taken off of blood pressure medication just from the jaw surgery, because it's all wow. related to sleep problems, breathing problems. Mm -hmm. in those mm -hmm. cases. Yeah. And one of the big takeaways from the first 10 minutes of your interview with Dr. Gunson was he was talking about how um, uh, there's there's reasons why orthodontists are reluctant to send patients off to have jaw surgery, even though jaw surgery probably allows people to avoid a lot of hassle of failed orthodontic or underwhelming orthodontic therapies, right? It's just that um, there's a lot of fear, basically fear from everyone, fear from the patient, fear from the patient's family, fear from the orthodontist about sending the patient off and getting a asymmetric or otherwise... Uh, botched for lack of better terms result. And as a result of all that fear, um, patients aren't really get, they're missing out on this opportunity to have this, you know, go in, you know, go in, go to sleep and wake up with a whole new face that solves maybe 80% of your problems just like that. Yeah. And I think, um, a lot of orthodontists who are airway focused have jaw surgeons or oral maxillofacial surgeons they work with and they kind of team up and they have their protocol. But if you're talking to maybe a traditional orthodontist who's not airway focused and is more like, oh, we just need to align the teeth or, oh, you have an open bite where your teeth don't meet, you need a jaw surgery for that reason. They're thinking along different lines versus these practitioners who are airway focused. And my consultations with airway focused orthodontists all said you need jaw surgery. They said, wow. you can try MSE. And C, and Dr. Ting, a lot of his patients do MSC and don't need jaw surgery anymore because they feel good. Like they feel like, oh, you know what? I don't have the problems I had before, which is great. Um, Maybe you're in that category. Yeah, I feel like, yeah. I mean, hopefully. I'm in that category. Yeah. I, I, you know, I had MSE. It solved my problems, let's say, you know, 65%. Um, but I still fantasize about having jaw surgery. Yeah. I met with a surgeon earlier this year, Dr. Pushkar Mehra at BU, and he was kind of lukewarm about it. He was like, eh, I could operate on you, but I'm not crazy about the idea. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of where I'm at with it. It's like, well, I sort of could and I sort of couldn't. Either way, I'm sort of surviving, right? Like I'm doing okay and my life is pretty much normal. But there's always that temptation when you've done all the research and you know all the best surgeons and orthodontists. Like It's like shopping for anything. You get so deep into it, and it's almost like you can't relieve the tension until you, <laughs> until you buy it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Especially when, in, when you're in this airway world, you've, we all are in the rabbit hole, right? You're sucked into the rabbit hole of airway. And, yeah, it's our little – it's our – our group and our crew that really knows and understands this, you're kind of like an insider when you know, like, 
what happens when you don't breathe well, and what happens when your facial structure isn't grown to its full potential. And then you start learning about all these different treatment options and things like that. So yeah, it kind of, that's funny. You fantasize about <laughs> jaw surgery. <laughs> Only we would get that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, listening to this. <laughs> every, yeah, right. Everyone watching this interview, I guarantee you, they would all love to have a, a you know, a big fat MSE expansion and then a big juicy jaw surgery. <laughs> yeah. But the MSE was not um, bad you know, at all. And to provide relief and maybe fix the issue. That's amazing. And I think a lot of people are able to avoid major jaw surgeries because of that. And now with the piezo, so the corta, um, corticotomy, um, I believe Dr. Ting just said in his last course, he's only had one patient in the past year where the suture did not split. Mm, so it's, mm. the success rate is really high now with that technique. Yeah. But Casey Lee, had a was very critical of that claim in his most recent presentation. I don't know if you follow <laughs> the drama. Casey Lee is like um he's 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 a great shit talker. Mm -hmm. Uh and maybe he gets good results too though with his ease and a lot of people are crazy about ease, but I had Dr. Lipkin on my channel like 6 months ago. Dr. Lipkin and Dr. Ting are boys and Lipkin said he's had a 100% success rate with the pizzo surgical assist. And then Casey Lee mocked that in his most recent presentation where he was like, there's this doctor on the East coast, a well-known orthodontist who, uh, <clears throat> claims a 100% success rate, uh, with the MSE and the surgical assist. And, um, so I want to use that drama point to transition to something you brought up earlier that I didn't think we were going to talk about, but you mentioned FME, the face genix maxillary expander, that has no arms. It's just this big fat MSE on steroids. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? My discord server is going crazy with like speculation and hope about this FME expander. Yeah. So, um, in Dr. Ting's course, that I just took last Friday. He talked about that and, um, I hadn't heard of it before then. So yeah, it's actually six tads in parallel right along the suture, but you don't, you can't move the appliance uh, to the sides, it can only go forward or back movement. And um, there's no dental tipping because it's not hooked onto the teeth at all. But I know Dr. Ting, if he uses a mark your MSC, the dental tipping that happens doesn't matter that much because he realigns the teeth in the bone anyways, um, in the Invisalign or aligner phase. Um, yeah, I guess it's maybe a more general area with FME, it's less maybe individualized, but I don't know enough detail. That'd be something to ask an orthodontist who uses it. I think it sounds promising, but it's only for certain maybe cases where you, you can only move it forward or back. And in this course, they showed sometimes they needed to adjust the positioning of the MARPI. Um, and you can't do that in a side transverse plane, I guess, with mm. the enemy. Um, mm. I think Dr. Jing said he uses it on adult males. Um, it's mm. a lot stronger because it has the six tads. Um, and I don't know if I remember him, what else he said about it, but yeah, FMB, okay. the MRP, the MSC, those are what we covered in that part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nerd level 16 on this topic. I interviewed Dr. Yusefian last week and he said that the, the arms are actually important because when you're expanding the maxilla, the upper teeth run into reverse pressure from, is it the muscles in this area? And if you don't have the arms on the appliance stabilizing those upper teeth as they collide with the musculature in that area, it, it brings them in and, um, you know, has a, uh, it's, uh, the opposite of what you want to do, which is to expand. It's, it's pull, it pushing those teeth back in. So his argument was that, you know, the molar arms are actually necessary to prevent that from happening. But as you said, this is kind of like the jurisdiction of the orthodontists, but yeah, um, it's probably the primary uh, topic of interest 
of my audience is the technical differences between these different maxillary expanders. And that would be like a good question to ask the orthodontist that uses all of them or who's had experience with all of them. Like, why do they prefer one versus another? And look, I always tell people get multiple opinions as long as they're from airway focused orthodontist. You don't want to go see an orthodontist who doesn't attend to airway um, Mm -hmm. as your opinions, but hear what they have to say and listen. Like if somebody says I have a hundred percent, percent success rate at something. Well, that's a big claim to make. So they probably do have a hundred percent success rate because they probably wouldn't be saying that, you know, on a big scale for everyone to hear if they've had any failures. And we yeah, take that Casey Lee. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but I know that <laughs> success rate with the piezo until in his course, he just said, he just had his first case where the suture didn't split. So I'm sure nobody is probably going to want to make that bold of a claim without feeling comfortable backing it. Cause what is that thing? Uh, never say all, wait, never say always, wait, always. I don't know. Never say always and never say never. I don't know. Like make sure you're not saying always, unless I guess you can back it up, but, um, yeah, right. Right. I forget the and case that Dr. Ting had said the suture didn't split. I forget why there was some, it was Wolverine. It was Wolverine. His bones were made out of titanium. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. That's gotta be the only reason, but, um, yeah, no, it's interesting. There's a lot of different opinions also, even from airway focused practitioners and it's overwhelming for patients and can be confusing. So, yeah. Do you think it's a compensation when I, when I like touch my neck and my chin like this, is that a compensation of some kind? Not that I can tell. Um, I always tell patients, I have a rule, a list of like a do not list, do not do certain things. One is do not lean on your hand. Okay, because mm-hmm. the TMJ is a mobile joint. When you put pressure on there, you're affecting the joint. You could move teeth. We want good posture. Pulling like here, I don't think that's a competition. Okay. Compensation. It could be a like conditioned behavior. If you feel a certain way, you're you're you know tired or whatever, you might do that. Or but it, I don't think that has anything to do with your functioning of your mouth and muscles. Okay. Okay. Compensation. It's not in this. Yeah. Keep going. Tell me. I was just going to say, it's not in the same class as like, you know, biting a fingernail or like, um, so that would be like a a oral habit, nail biting, Mm. um, you know, tongue chewing, sucking, cheek biting. Those are like noxious oral habits compensations. I mean, it could be a compensation to open the airway. Like sometimes Mm. people might have such habits, um, or chewing, chewing gum is a habit I don't like. We tell our patients no gum chewing because it puts too much pressure on the joints. And oh my God, no gum chewing. My audience is, there, is like, they're up in arms right I now. I shouldn't have said that because what we tell our patients, at least from our perspective, is if you're chewing gum habitually, that can actually widen the tongue so it's less likely to easily fit in the palate if you're going chewing gum, spreading the sides of the tongue. But that can be a, a behavior that releases serotonin, endorphins that are kind of calming and regulating for the body. If you get your tongue resting, sucked up in the correct position, lips closed, breathing through your nose, that can actually be regulating and calming for the body with correct tongue posture. And you don't need to be chewing gum, biting your nails, things like that. But back to compensations, I typically view habits versus compensations and a compensation would be a behavior or action that would facilitate something else. So a compensation for um, getting your tongue up might be you have to protrude your jaw or your jaw slides. So um, to say an S sound, your your jaw comes forward or your jaw might slide to the side Mm -hmm. or your facial muscles all tense up or your chin tenses up when you close your lips. Those are muscular compensations that might be different from like actions that you're doing like this or nail mm-hmm. or stuff like that. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It does. It does. When you're suctioning, um, should the, the teeth be gently touching or so like, for example, when I'm suctioning my lower jaw, my teeth are not touching and my lower jaw is sliding forward a bit as if to try to open up my airway. Cause if I bite, if I, if I bring my teeth together, when I'm suctioning at rest, I feel like my lower jaw is back and my airway is a little bit constricted. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Your jaw might come forward slightly. So that suction will allow the lower jaw to relax. So the teeth separate. You want your teeth slightly apart at rest, not tight. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so cool. that's light dental freeway space. So I say lips closed in this order, 
lips closed, tongue sucked up, teeth slightly apart. Mm -hmm. I actually have that printed out and I make, well, I don't know if anybody listens to me, but I make my patients cut it out in strips of paper and tape it all over their house, their car, everywhere, because part of this training, it's neuromuscular re-education, but it's also conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. You have to not only train the muscles, but you have to be conscious all throughout the day until it becomes a new pattern. You have to check yourself. Are your lips closed? Tongue sucked up, teeth apart all throughout the day. We put reminders all over the place for the patient. So it's not just exercises, but it's also conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nicole, we're approaching an hour and a half. Can I rifle through some of the questions from my yeah. discord server? For sure. Okay. And you can, um, yeah. What, uh, why don't we say like, um, you know, short to medium length answers to these questions. So <laughs> I can pack me. in okay. a, a handful of them. <laughs> Cut me off. Uh, okay. No, no, <laughs> I would never, because whenever you go off like that, it's just pure, uh, pure brilliance and informational <laughs> gold that comes out. Um, how common are orofacial myofunctional disorders in the general population? Now, I think I heard there's a statistic like 30% of the population. I don't buy that. I, think I heard that. Now, this is the same thing with airway issues, sleep breathing issues. How common? Well, I think a lot of people aren't diagnosed. So do we really know how common these things are? When you talk about sleep apnea, I believe it's 80% of females and 90% of males are undiagnosed walking around not knowing when they do like epidemiology, epidemiology studies or whatever. So I think the number I heard is like 30% of people mm -hmm. have orofacial myofunctional disorders. I you know. Yeah, I would put it at, at least double that. But, but, um, but wait, how can how can we really know though, right? And here's the thing, things yeah. are only a problem. If they're a problem. If you have a tongue tie, it's only a problem if it's causing problems. If your tongue is resting low, if we need to investigate what the problems are there. So we need to look maybe beyond, you know, structure and just kind of talk about symptoms and what are the actual problems. So calling something a disorder, there's a range, right, of what's kind of normal or, you know, Com are you compensating to get to normal or so it's kind of, I don't know. I kind of got into a gray area, but anyways, you can. Listen. No, but like, if it's not a problem today, it doesn't mean it's not a problem because like you could go 40 years smoking a pack of Marlboro's a day and it's not a problem till it's a problem, but it's always been a problem because it's going to be a problem eventually. And what I say along that line too, is like these children that we see structural anomalies, we see dental crowding narrow palate, retruded jaws, who cares if they get a sleep study? Why is that important? Treat the structure to make it as mm. ideal as possible um, versus like, are we going to send them to a sleep doctor for a sleep study? And oh, the sleep study came back fine or mild. They're fine. No, fix the structure. Like mm. when you see signs of dysfunction, let's just correct it. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't mm -hmm. become a problem later if there are no symptoms because Signs often appear before symptoms are present, but when you're asking numbers, I guess 30% is what the number is. Some Somewhere okay. I read that, I don't remember. Okay. On that note, um, what advice do you give to parents of a newborn baby? Um, okay. Well, breastfeeding, if they can breastfeed as long as possible, at least a year or more, that's great. If they're having issues or struggles to see a lactation consultant or a speech pathologist who's certified in my, or who's a myofunctional therapist, but who works with that early intervention population, because I think a lot of parents and mothers may struggle with issues with nursing and then just feel like they're a failure when really there could be something else going on. So nursing is great. Um, try to avoid pacifiers or finger sucking habits, or at least after four to six months of age, we don't want those behaviors to occur anymore. Um, so that pacifier being crammed into the baby's mouth can affect not only the muscles and the speech and the social interactions, but it can cause, um, you know, a cascade of events. So I would also recommend um, typically at six months of age is when babies want that open cup drinking. So we don't want to use sippy cups, um, no sucking cups or spouts, but rather use open 
free flow drinking because we don't want to overwork the cheek muscles with low tongue posture. So there's a website called Top Tools that has really great feeding items and special cups that can be used for young babies to help promote good growth and development. Um, we want to not use all pureed processed foods, but really get these kids chewing, chewing muscles trigger that bone growth. So chewing on soft or chewing on hard foods, like the baby wed leaning, or baby wed, uh, baby led weaning, <laughs> baby led weaning um, is a good concept as well. Um, what is that in a nutshell? I keep hearing baby led weaning around and then I see pictures of like, you know, kids chewing on like chicken legs and stuff. Yes. <laughs> what, <Yeah. So laughs> what's baby led weaning? Yeah. And I might not be able to define it exactly the way it is, but the general concept is um, having the baby start chewing like more natural foods versus prepared, processed, blended foods. So actually using their jaws and their muscles to eat regular foods, maybe cooked carrots or things like that, um, and eating table foods and foods that the family is eating versus blending and using sucking pouches and processed pureed foods. Um, so you go right from the right from the tit to like real food and you let the baby manage that process. You don't hold their hand and like live in fear of them choking on solid food. You kind of yeah. give it to them, pose them the challenge of eating solid food and then and let them take the lead. nature to that. And it's a whole way it's done. So I wouldn't just go ahead and do that, but like following their protocol. And then if a child has issues like feeding challenges or tongue tie or things like that, those types of programs need to be modified by a therapeutic practitioner, but baby led weaning, yeah, there's tons of information on it online and how to carry out such a program. But yeah, it's really feeding them what you're eating at dinner. You rip, if you're eating chicken, you put it in little pieces so the baby can then feed themselves and use the same foods that the adults are eating, but probably modified in certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like maybe how back in the day things were done without before um, we had advancements and, oh, let's, let's blend up everything so it's a liquid and put it in a little pouch so the baby sucks it or the kid sucks the carrot, apple, banana juice, well, you know? And so now we're, that's causing, that causes problems with the face, the human face. Yeah. It's disgusting too. I, it's so disappointing when I see a baby sucking yogurt out of a straw or something, you know, it's not, it's not just like that. It makes a mess. Baby led weaning makes a mess. It's just upsets me to know that, you know, the baby is being fed, you know, some high fructose corn syrup, you know, slop that's also causing their face to collapse. And even like sippy cups, um, those are for convenience, of course, but really your your child is not supposed to walk around drinking juice or milk. So it's they drink that at meals, whatever they're supposed to drink that's not water. But if they're walking around, it should be water. So if it spills, it's not a big deal. So those sippy cups are really promoting that tongue thrust, low tongue posture, and narrow palate. Um, and those can be big problems. So we don't recommend any of that as well for parents. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And also you said, what would I recommend to a new parent? I mean, it's very progressive in how much you want to give somebody, but really we want our children like breathing through the nose, lips closed, not having noisy breathing, good, good nasal hygiene, things like that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, can myofunctional therapy alone have a proud, a profound effect on an adult's aesthetics? So we always stick to our goals and we try not to talk out of that, make claims. So our goals are correct oral rest posture and good chewing and swallowing of foods like with saliva. That's all. Now, on top of that, we can have some much icing on the cake cherry on top. So by establishing those goals, people tend to breathe better, sleep better, stop snoring. Um, perhaps the facial muscles tends to tighten up. Um, smiling is like the best exercise, right? You keep smiling. Well, those curmudgeon old people who look so grumpy to now sag your skin, they're not smiling. So even just smiling will tone up muscles, helps keep, what helps keep your skin from sagging is muscles. So mm. yeah, if you're keeping your facial muscles strengthened and toned, you're probably going to have better facial development, better muscles, um, you know, tighter skin. Do I say myofunctional therapy is a cosmetic treatment? No, but could it help with that? Sure. I would think so. Just like it can help with teeth alignment. We don't treat teeth. We don't treat aligning teeth, 
But I have many, all of us myofunctional therapists have many before and after pictures of patients whose bite has closed, teeth have changed just by getting the tongue out of the way and the lips closed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is um, with playing the didgeridoo or another wind instrument potentially be a kind of myofunctional therapy? Well, it's not myofunctional therapy, but um, the didgeridoo is shown to reduce the severity of sleep apnea because it strengthens the oral pharyngeal muscles. Same mm -hmm. with any double reed instrument like the French horn, the bassoon, I believe the clarinet. By increasing that pressure at the back of the throat, that's causing muscle tension to help open up the airway. So mm -hmm. I actually do have patients, I don't have them play the didgeridoo. I bought a didgeridoo. It's about five feet long and it looks really cool but it's so hard. I could not get that thing to work. My whole family were like trying their spit all over the place. Um, it's really hard. If you could play the didgeridoo, you probably don't have sleep apnea. Um, but the breather is something you can order online. That is probably about 50 bucks. Um, it's on, on Amazon. It's a nasal in, um, inspiration, expiration with resistance, and that can help tighten up the muscles of the throat. We have patients use that, or we do an exercise with a balloon to help get pressure at the back of the throat and increase muscle strength. So that is one concept, like a musical instrument like that is a concept that's research has shown can help increase um, or decrease airway problems, increase airway strength, but it's not like basically functional therapy. Right. Right. Uh, it would be like an adjunct to myofunctional therapy, myofunctional therapy, having a very specific definition and living within very, very specific discrete walls of what is myofunctional therapy and what is the goal of myofunctional therapy. Yeah. If I could um, get patients to play the didgeridoo, that would be totally an, an activity I would have them do. Like mm. I would say, have a didgeridoo, let's do that 10 minutes a day. That's shown to help. We do a similar concept with like a balloon. And so it's a, probably one sort of exercise with a similar goal. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about the, uh, uh, negative effect of training mouth breathing though, in that way. No, mm -mm. we, I mean, it's just the temporary moment of playing. You mean a didgeridoo, like the instrument or blowing balloons or using that breather tool oh, because the air is coming out of the mouth. Well, didgeridoo is interesting the way it's a circular airflow. I've researched mm, this and I mm. don't get it cause I can't do it. Um, but the, it's a circular breathing. Have you ever heard of that? I have. Yes. Weird. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I couldn't do it. Um, but no, it's I'm not really gonna, hard. Yeah. It's, I couldn't do it, but the, no blowing a balloon. Now you're, it's not, I'm not worried about training mouth breathing. We actually use diaphragmatic breathing when we work on balloon blowing. And then we actually have our patients hold the airflow in the balloon against the pressure at the back of their throat. And they're actually going to hold that and hum and humming releases increased nitric oxide and it also causes more tension at the back of the throat. So we have a whole protocol we do with that where you're not like constantly mouth breathing. But like I said, we train our patients lips closed at rest, conscious awareness of that. So I'm, that's not a problem. Well, so, right, right. What you're describing is more like um, by, by uh, blowing up a balloon and then kind of holding it with the force, the balloon pushing back onto your airway. It's almost like stopping halfway down on a push-up and kind of resting there under tension. It's like time under tension without necessarily just breathing the whole time. Yeah, and you can feel this pressure at the back of your throat. You feel your throat opens. And then we kind of added this yawn, like a simulated yawn. So pretend I'm talking and you're, and you're tired and you want to yawn, but you don't want me to know you're yawning. You've probably been doing that this whole time right now. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> I do that a lot. <laughs> okay. So you're, if you do that, you feel like this like opening in your throat, right? Mm. Do that also with a balloon blown up. You're holding airflow. Hold that airflow in the balloon with your mouth and then simulate a yawn. Some people can't really do that, but you feel even added tension at the back of the throat, added mm. opening of the airway. So there's different ways to play around with that that exercises the muscles. Yeah, but I used to do <laughs> Good to know you've been faking yawns this whole time. Thank Not this much. interview, but... Other, other, other <laughs> interviews I have, sure. but I had a friend who called me out on it once. He was like, <laughs> dude, you can just yawn. And I was <laughs> like, oh, busted. <laughs> you you're actually doing an exercise for your airway. So. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. <laughs> um, so just to put a ribbon on, um, on this topic, I tried blowing balloons with my nose Oh gosh! <laughs> and I, 
I think I gave myself an ear infection doing that. That's so yeah. yeah, yeah, it was so, but like, cause I was really obsessed with this idea of not like training mouth breathing because even when I'm running and sprinting and stuff, I'm nose breathing. I mm. can't ever think of a reason to blow out of my mouth except, you know, well, playing the didgeridoo or something. So I was like, well, balloon blowing is great, but I don't love the idea of mouth breathing. So maybe I can just blow it through my nose and strengthen my airway that way. It was great until it wasn't. Did you really get an ear infection? I, my ear started getting funky and like my, my ears popped like crazy, first of all. Mm. And then like that night I was like, oh no, I think I'm getting sick. I think I blew back some crud into the wrong canal or something. Yeah, that sounds a little not so normal <laughs> to blow balloon with your nose. It's like you blow bubbles with your nose. People, you, that's one way to lose a lot of friends is if you just start blowing balloons with your nose or bubble. I mean, it could look really weird actually, but that's actually a good activity for kids. Probably um, a balloon that's too much resistance. That's could pop an eardrum, I would think, but maybe actually blowing bubbles with your nose. You just made me think of a fun activity to teach nose breathing with a visual, you know, reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, there is an instrument called the Hawaiian nose flute that's that. played played with the nose. So it could be an alternative to the didgeridoo mm -hmm. for someone who's like really wants to, you know, channel all that power, but into nasal breathing instead of mouth breathing. Um, but it's really hard to play the nose flute or the, um, the Hawaiian nose flute. Um, yeah. Hmm. So, Interesting. um, all right. Uh, allow me, um, <clears throat> what's, what do you think is the optimal myofunctional diet? What do you mean? For adults. So like plant-based, animal-based, mixed, um, fresh bread, uh, beef, um, how cooked to what degree, uh, you already said no gum. So yeah, I don't think we have like a myofunctional diet, but we know working the, the muscles of the jaws are good, especially in growth and development and throughout the lifetime. So Using eating a variety of foods, chewing on both sides of your mouth. That's not diet, but the function, the way we, we chew, you want to chew on both sides evenly, 50%. So whether you're switching the food back and forth between the sides or chewing on both sides evenly um, and chewing with your lips closed. So I'm not going to talk about foods because, I mean, that's sort of out of maybe the scope of myofunctional therapists with adults. I mean, I've never been asked that question. That's interesting. Um, but chewing a variety of textures, um, if someone has jaw problems, so TMD, and they're having pain, we want them to be on more a soft diet, you know, so there's a different depending on different conditions. But, um, you know, obviously, eating healthier foods, vegetables, typically lower carbs, um, that's going to be healthy. So it's not the what, it's the how. Yeah, and probably, I guess, a little bit of what's going to play a role because you want to make sure you're chewing and you're using your muscles. As mm -hmm. people maybe get older and maybe if, you know, elderly people are put on only soft foods or, you know, drinking smoothies and sure, whatever, muscles probably start to degrade. So you want to make sure when we're talking about the how, also your um, chewing sufficiently. So we say about 15 chews per bite. A lot of our patients are fast eaters, don't chew enough. And the first step in the process of digestion is the chewing in the mouth part. The saliva releases salivary amylase that begins to break down the food. It's an enzyme. And if you don't chew enough and you swallow your food too quickly, um, you can have digestive issues, gas, pain, bloating, things like that, because you haven't sufficiently digested sufficiently digested food. So chewing evenly on both sides, chewing sufficiently, chewing with the lips closed. And we teach like the motion of chewing and how the tongue should go as well to promote good muscle development. Have you ever heard of Fletcherism or Horace Fletcher by any chance? Mm -mm. No. So I'll write it down. <laughs> it, Horace Fletcher, also known as the great masticator, was this uh, health influencer, you could say, from the early 1900s. And he went on this massive tour of the whole world, teaching people thorough mastication. And he swore okay. that like the root cause of so many illnesses that were emerging at that time was that people weren't thoroughly masticating their food. They were swallowing it whole 
and then basically putting a huge burden on their body to do the work of digestion that the teeth and the saliva were supposed to do in the mouth. That makes sense. Like, yeah, I mean, you you find a lot of our patients are, if you, I have them eat in the evaluation to see what's going on. And I mean, they're swallowing food whole. They're chewing with just the front teeth, not on the back molars. And then all of a sudden they just burp and or get the hiccups. And you're like, well, you're swallowing air. Like it's it's a whole process. But yeah, mastication builds and forms bone. That is key to our jaws. Mm -hmm. So my theory about why Horace Fletcher was even necessary at that time was that jaws were starting to collapse in the early 1900s and people were compensating by swallowing their food whole like so many of us do including myself with these lingual braces i find myself all the time rushing food down because it's so uncomfortable for me to to chew in you know with the, all this metal in my mouth so i think people were like forgetting how to chew at that time because jaws were collapsing and then you needed someone like horace fletcher to come in and remind everyone about how to chew chew naturally. So he had this idea of um, masticating the food until it swallowed itself. And he would, the way he taught people to chew properly was to tell them to extract all of the flavor from the food. Mm -hmm. So you basically keep it in your mouth until all of the flavor comes out. And yeah. then what you find is that the, the food swallows itself. The tongue will just naturally work things back to the, to the back of the mouth and then lift up and take the food down. You don't even actually intentionally swallow. It just happens by itself as you, as you extract flavor. That's interesting. And probably it's kind of liquefied. So reflexively, you just automatically swallow. And it also probably promotes like some mindfulness while we're eating because we're probably, you know, checking Facebook, doing work on the computer, talking to friends while we're eating. And it's nice to be quiet and chew with your mouth closed and just chew and Think about the flavor and process the food. That's probably a healthier, better way to eat. Mindful eating. Yeah. Yeah. And he described it also as extremely blissful. So he yeah. said that when you chew properly and you focus on the flavor of the food, it's like, you know, he called it, he, his book was called like the new Epicureanism, mm -hmm. which is to say like this new practice of heightened pleasure. Yeah. Makes sense. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so. Anyway, he was from my hometown, so that's another reason why I like him. He was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts, Okay, which is where I live. Um, anyway. That's where you live right now? Yes, yeah, so I live in the next town over, okay. which is Methuen, but that's where I grew up in Lawrence. Okay. Yeah, small world, Horace Fletcher. Um, all right, I promise we're almost there. Oh, no, I'm fine. Um, Mike Mew, we're going to get a little controversial here. Mike Mew said in an interview two years ago that his grandfather, who was an orthodontist, remembered that during his time, there was a wave of, uh, cr there was a craze about tongue tie. And then John Mew remembers that when he was in his prime, there was another wave of enthusiasm or uh, another craze about tongue tie. And now we're going through yet another like tongue tie craze. Is it a craze or is there really an explosion of tongue ties in the world? Yeah. So they don't necessarily think it's increased in nature, but it, like it's more of a, a common occurrence, but it's probably recognized more commonly. And maybe that has to do with increased incidence of breastfeeding and mothers wanting to nurse babies and noticing I'm having problems because oftentimes that will be a symptom of a tongue tie is, um, presents as difficulties nursing. Um, back in like maybe the 50s, there was less mothers who wanted to nurse, so they put babies on bottles. And so there wasn't a lot of breastfeeding going on at that time. And perhaps now there's more breastfeeding occurring and then people are noticing there's more problems. Um, so yeah, I don't think they really know exactly. You know, maybe we're more aware of Myofunctional issues now and tongue posture and noticing that that is a contributing factor and attending to that more. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they think, oh, there's actually an increase in tongue ties now. Okay. Okay. Mike also said in that same interview that he sees a lot of tongue ties that after they get released, they end up worse than before the release. And he attributed that to um, basically lack of myofunctional therapy following the release. What are your thoughts on that? Have you seen a lot of that? Is that a, is it dangerous to get your tongue tie 
corrected without having myofunctional therapy at the same time? Mm -hmm, definitely. It could be. So if you have an airway problem and you don't do pre myofunctional therapy and they release the tongue tie, the breathing issue could actually be worse because it could be the tongue tie. It's kind of like a leash on a dog, like holding the tongue in a position. And when you cut off the leash or release the tongue, if the dog or tongue doesn't know where to go, my analogy, um, it could fall back into your airway even more when you're sleeping. Um, some patients we diagnose, there's a restricted lingual frenum, but it does not need to be released after a month of myofunctional therapy because the muscles are able to function correctly. So we always need to do at least a month of myofunctional therapy before we refer anyone for a release, um, strengthen the muscles correctly. It'll actually help the release provider do a more thorough release when the muscles can be separated from the frenum tissue with proper tone. The tongue will know where to go after and you resume the therapy after for rehabilitation. If you do nothing before and after or nothing after, it could actually not only functionally be worse, but it can scar down. And scar tissue is a lot thicker and less elastic than um, regular, regular tissue. So mucosal tissue or fascia, scar tissue is actually like like bars versus like spider webs. It's like thick, thick bars and that could actually make the restriction even worse. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we definitely guide our patients. I've had some patients referred after a release and say, Oh, I was supposed to, I'm supposed to see you. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you did no pre-work. Like, and I've had patients say, I'm getting a release next week. And I was told to come see you I'm like, well, you're going to need to reschedule that because I'm the one that will refer you when I know the muscles are ready. So usually, um, it's the guidance of the myofunctional therapist to do that referral when they deem the patient is ready muscular wise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is Dr. Zaghi the gold standard of tongue tie release? And what are your thoughts on um, so-called functional tongue tie release and the uh, sometimes it being necessary to even cut into the genioglossus muscle as part of a tongue tie release? Yeah, I think it's probably more rare to cut into the muscle. So Dr. Zaghi does a functional frenuloplasty. Mm -hmm. And for that to be actually under those guidelines, the patient has to be awake because they will be sucking the tongue up during the procedure. And he uses sutures. Always sutures are used. So that's kind of the definition of functional frenuloplasty. It has to meet those two criteria. So, um, what do you mean he uses sutures? Like he actually stitches yeah, the patient? Yeah, it afterwards? always has and, to be stitches as opposed to left open. And does he use a, a scalpel instead of a laser? He uses now laser or both, depending on the yeah. needs and the, the assessment of the patient. He doesn't always go into the muscle by any means, it's just if it's needed. So, during the procedure, he judges what's needed as he has a patient suck their tongue up functional, right? Sucking their tongue up. He sees range of motion and does more or less, you know, depending on what's needed. So it's kind of an, a live procedure. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's other practitioners that have different techniques, but, you know, you want to make sure it's done thoroughly, meaning the posterior or the back portion that's restricted is also released, not just the front. It has to be released sufficiently to allow the mid and back portions of the tongue to go up. Um, so yeah, I, I think that probably, yeah, that that's, that's great. Do you think there's a lot of botched tongue tie releases happening out there with providers who are learning about them as part of the recent craze and then just sort of, you know, hitting people with the laser and hoping for the best? Well, I can't really judge to that because I think if you're part of like the recent craze, you're probably really interested in this and you're probably taking courses and you're kind of knowing how to do it correctly. But if you're mm -hmm. not into airway and you're doing tongue tie releases, you might not get it. So I know Dr. Zaghi and the practitioners I refer to will only do a release if the patient is in active myofunctional therapy. They won't just take any patient. They know the importance of that. So I just had a patient, um, somebody actually was asking me that they have a patient who's referred to them that's scheduled next week for the procedure. Well, clearly that provider does not have the level of expertise that we would want because they schedule a patient for a procedure and the patient's not even in myofunctional therapy. Mm. Just got that referral. So maybe more traditional practitioners might not be releasing correctly. I had a, we had a five-year-old that they just released the front. He had to go back to a new practitioner three days later, get the rest released. So 
I would say, I don't know if I would say maybe people who don't understand the concept are maybe not doing them correctly, but maybe people are, who are taking recent courses and are into it. I can't judge. I just know I only have like two people or a small amount of people I refer to because I've had many that have come back from like maybe an ENT doctor who doesn't um, know about function in terms of what we're looking for and didn't do a thorough release. Okay. So okay. you, you kind of know the practitioner and if you're a patient, you do your research or ask your myofunctional therapist and they'll usually have a person they refer to that they okay. know does it correctly. Thank you. Um, I spoke with a guy in his late twenties about four months ago who told me that he had a buckle tie release mm -hmm. as it was sort of tacked on to his tongue tie release you know, as part of the package that he was sold by his dentist. During the buckle tie release, he started, so buckle tie release being in here. Mm -hmm. Is that right? The cheeks. Mm -hmm. Yep. The yep. Cheeks. There's he a started, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Upper, buck, upper buckle tie release, he started bleeding in the chair. Mm -hmm. They tried getting it to stop. It wouldn't stop. It got worse. They had to rush him to the hospital because he was losing so much blood. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's very typical. I've never heard of anything like that. So I mm -hmm. wouldn't want people to get scared of getting a release because of that. But I believe if you're a trained practitioner, you would know how to handle if there's bleeding. Sometimes there's blood vessels, even with tongue tie releases, there's blood vessels that the practitioner needs to stay away from. Or if something happens to bleed, they know how to handle it. So um, I would think that's probably a very rare occurrence. And I, that's a total anomaly in this yeah. space. You don't hear about that happening yeah. regularly. No, no, I never heard of okay. anything like that. Good to know. I mean, it's scared that. And I've seen trainings where they say there's a blood vessel, like for a tongue tie release, when as they're training the practitioners. So this is how we handle that. And we don't go that or we don't go a certain, you know, people are should be trained how to handle that. So I don't know about buckle uh, tie releases and blood vessels and things like that, though. Okay. In general, though, would you say buckle and lip lip tie releases are less needed than tongue tie releases for your typical adult patient? You know, for us, it's is it affecting function? So we always go back to those rest, posture, chewing, swallowing, foods, liquid, saliva. So if a person has like a short upper lip or rest high, mm -hmm. and there is a thick maxillary frenum, that might need to be released because that's holding, making it difficult for them to close their lips, right? Mm -hmm, we want mm -hmm. lip closure. So um, it's not necessarily less common. Probably tongue tie releases are more common, but if somebody has a restricted maxillary frenum, like mm -hmm. a lip tie, usually there's a tongue tie also. Those tend to go hand in hand. But does it go if there's a tongue tie, there's usually a lip tie? No, it's the other way around. The other way around, right. Yeah, exactly. So I heard recently that like, um, it's a, it's a high percentage of people are actually, uh, like grade three on the TM TRMR, which means that a, a, a high percentage of people have like moderate to significant restricted tongue motion mm -hmm. and are probably candidates for a release. Would you say a lesser percentage would be candidates for a lip tie release? Probably. There's okay. probably less common for a restricted upper lip or lower lip than tongue. Okay. So we want to take it case by case, but if a patient is going in for a tongue tie release, they should not automatically just opt in for the lip tie, buckle tie release package that might get thrown at them at the same time. They should pause and they should really take a, a better look at that. Well, it's not really the patient in at least our office and our situations. We refer the patient for a lip tie and a tongue tie. We tell the practitioner what's causing the functional problem. It's not just yeah. like guess or what do you want? It's a package. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. it causing a functional problem? So if the person rests with their lips closed, they're not a mouth breather, then, and there's no other functional issues like with smile or chewing or things like that, like we assess for that, then we wouldn't need the lip, a lip tie release unless there's, there's gotta be a reason for it, right? It's not a problem totally. it's causing a problem. Okay. I guess where I'm coming from, Nicole, is like, I so I talk to a lot of patients and they tell me what the doctor is proposing and I give them my feedback, you know, and um, a lot of times they're, you know, patients will go in, they'll see the doctor and he'll say, tongue tie release, lip tie release, buckle release. And I'll say, well, tongue tie release probably, but uh, 
you know, we may want to get another we, another set of eyes on about the lip tie and the buckle tie release. So I, I just feel like it's often, yeah. I feel like it's often sold as a package, an upsell. Like you know, you buy the new car, and then you know, um, that you up you upgrade to the nice floor mats at the same time. Like they throw on they throw on the lip tie release as like an add on. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about that because I haven't had many situations where that's occurred. Um, I mean, I've heard of some offices where they just release the buckles and do it all. I don't think I've, I think it's been rare where I've ever referred for a buckle tie release. Um, some people do, but definitely lip and tongue. And um, yeah, I, I, it's not it's not necessarily where I send them and then the, the practitioner might add on more. I haven't really seen that that much. It's like, oh, this is what the patient needs, and then they do that. So, got it, got it. Um, okay, last question. Super like lame last question, but <laughs> tongue tie release before or after MSE or other types of expansion? Yeah. So it depends on first of all the situation when you're getting the expansion, um, and. Okay, so we, if it's an RPE, which is more for a child, which is not drilled into the bone, that takes up a lot more space in the mouth than MSE, which is more flat on the palate. So MSE, we can start myofunctional therapy right away. RPE, that's totally different because it's almost like just wait till it's done. So if I evaluate a patient and they're not getting their MSE for a few months and they need a tongue tie release, I would typically do it before and I would want at least a month after the release for proper healing and getting the tongue stretched and up. That's fine. If they already have the MSC in or they're about to get the MSC placed within like two weeks or something, then I would just say, let's wait to release the tongue tie until after it's removed, after the MSC is removed. Oh, wow. wow. I give it like about a month space between the procedure being done and the rehabilitation before the MSC is going to be put in. And I judge on that, um, time frame. Wow. Such a, such a nuanced answer, but I think, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of cases where that comes up, Oh, they have a tongue tie. They're about to get MSC. What do we do? Like we have to brainstorm and think about, um, the case and the situation, the problem with releasing a tongue tie when there's an appliance on the palate is we want the tongue to be able to go up and stretch up and let those muscles stretch and it heal appropriately. So there's a healing phase and then also a functional phase. For the healing, we want that good lengthening of the tissue and stretching. And if it's gonna be pushed down by the MSC, we might as well wait to do the procedure till it's out. But if we have a good month of like stretching and healing, then we're good. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where where how we yeah you know you that's nailed our it our rule of what we kind of decided in our office. Sure, There's sure. Probably no right or wrong answer for that. Um, it's sometimes a sort of practitioner and case by case basis or decision. But RPE, that's a little bit different when the appliance is so big and bulky that um, we sometimes don't even start myofunctional therapy till that's removed because it's like you can't really function correctly with that in no matter what. Remember I said MSC, your tongue can suck up? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That it's like too, it's usually too big, too much. No, totally. It would be like putting a kid into shoes that are like three sizes too small and then trying to teach them how to run. Yeah. It's just counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And probably with a tongue tie release and MSC, if you have more than a month between the, the procedure and the MSC being installed, that's probably even better. But if you're like cutting it close, I would say it's probably sufficient. But it also depends. Here's the other thing. I'm sorry, but I just was like, why didn't I even say this? If the palate is so narrow where the tongue is not nearly going to fit anyways, then just wait until the expansion's done. So then you have the space for it. I was kind of thinking when we just started talking about that and I answered that question of like, oh, the appliance is blocking the tongue. But no, if you have an extremely narrow palate, your tongue's not going to fit anyways, then it might be better to wait till the expansion is done before releasing the tissue. Um, so that's again, where the myofunctional therapist decides on a case by case basis of how the, pre the patient presents, um, to know what to do. Were you but, like thinking of your own case? Cause you, maybe you were decent before you did your MSE, like decent enough to do some myofunctional therapy, but the expansion just made you better, but you forgot like a lot of 
some patients that get MSE are just like totally so, yeah. high in vaulting. Oh yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly. I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. I, I, um, I did myofunctional therapy and a bunch of stuff way before years before my MSE. Okay. So I was like primed. Okay. You were ready. Yeah. And once you get that correct oral rest posture, it can really maintain. Sometimes as adults, you do have to keep doing some exercises and kind of checking yourself. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, it can la it's supposed to last for your lifetime. Um, that good breathing. And sometimes we relapse and we need a little help. It's like working at the gym. You want to keep things toned and, and going, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who else do you think I should have on uh, my podcast besides Gerald Simmons? Any, any, any other sleepers in this space that mm. really should be brought to light more? There's so many good, good people. Um, I mean, Airway Circle is a great group um, who spreads a lot of public knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, Audrey Yoon, have you heard of Audrey Yoon? Of course, Audrey Yoon. Didn't she like invent TRMR or uh, no, she didn't invent it. But, like, Dr. Yoon and Dr. Zagi. Have you had Dr. Zagi on? No, I never met either of them. Oh my gosh. They're all so great. Um, I don't know if he works with Dr. Lee, but Dr. Stanley Liu, L-I-U, who's an Ooh. ENT. So out of yeah. Stanford, Dr. Liu, Dr. Yoon, and Dr. Zagi all were together in the Stanford group. These are all like amazing people, Dr. Hang. These are all like, you know, airway idols, if you want to call it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're the um, uh, Mount... Uh, What's that place? In Mount the Everest? Like no, not Mount Everest. Mount, uh, <laughs> the, yeah. With the president's faces I on it. I can't even think of what it's called. Mount um, Rushmore? Rushmore. Yeah, Mount yes, Rushmore. Yes, thanks. So, yeah. Um, yeah, they're like the faces <laughs> on Mount Rushmore. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of great people and they're, they're all, you know, can talk patient lingo so patients can understand not just doctor perspective, but patient perspective. But I think about the sleep, Dr. Simmons would be great because mm. he can really help clarify why a lot of your viewers are like, my sleep study is fine, but I have chronic headaches and, you know, fatigue. And that's so background. important. So, yeah. Oh my God. That's so important. People are so misled by their negative sleep study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they just end up chasing the rabbit down the rabbit hole further. They, in, they're crazy, right? Or they thinking think they have mental illness or... People are put on anti Lyme disease. Oh yeah. People are put on medications like antidepressants, ADHD medications without investigating sleep. I can't get over how many patients I see. I just read their questionnaire and I'm like, I can clearly see what's going on. And they're on, you know, all these different medications and no doctor has ever asked about their sleep or investigated. Um, mm. It's just, it, it's mind blowing, but we uh, do what we can. Oral surgeons. Um, that I should try to have on? Um, who, who jumps out to you as all-star surgeons out there? Uh, like Dr. Reza Movahead. Have you heard of him? He's a of he's course. the one that we're, I think we talked about him. He works with Dr. Hang or when Dr. Hang, before he retired, he's um, very airway focused mm -hmm. oral surgeon. Yeah, Washington University, I think. Well, um, hmm. I don't remember exactly. I don't think so, but I know he also has an office now in California, in Northern California. But Raise him overhead does? Mm -hmm. Yep, oh. in California. He's very airway um, savvy in his treatment mm -hmm. because not every, you could have the same degree, but not treat from an airway perspective. And I know he's one of the top oral maxillofacial surgeons in the country. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Gunson, you had him on Airway Circle. Mm -hmm. And I know you said you listened to only the beginning, but as you continue, it gets better. Like, I learned oh so God. much, like three, four, six, <laughs> eight, I was like, this is so good on all that TMD stuff. Really great. TMJ issues. Oh, yeah. TMD, uh, TMJ issues, super complex. Those are the worst, right? When you get patients who present with like TMJ pain and like, oh my God, mm -hmm. I, it breaks my heart because I really there's so few doctors that you actually feel comfortable sending them to yeah. because it's so complex and interconnected with airway and bite. And, mm -hmm. um, those are tough ones. And sleep. So and sleep. Yeah. another right. person, um, she's an airway focused dentist that started the ASAP group. Her name is Dr. Tracy Nguyen, T-R-A-C-E-Y-N-G-U-Y-E-N -E -E in Virginia. She's one of the three people that started ASAP as Airway Sleep and Pediatrics Pathway, um, but she treats all ages and she's great. She connected me with Dr. Ting. That's how I learned about him um, mm. is through Dr. Tracy Nguyen. 
and um, she's really smart. I think she's on Airway Circle or was just on there yesterday. Okay. Oh, no, today, okay. Thursday. She's on today. Yeah. Okay. I think Airway Circle, that channel is going to get a lot bigger. Right now, you guys have like not that many subscribers. And your your interview with Gunson has 212 views, which is absurd. Um, so I see big things for Airway Circle coming down the pike. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and by the way, feel free to take any content from this interview and use it there if you want. Um, so yeah, they on. have um, practitioner and they also have patient um, for Airway Circle. They have like on Facebook, there's Airway Circle patients. So if you do Facebook and you're a patient, you can ask questions and people answer your questions there. So it's not just like a professional's um, site, but they help out patients. They'll connect you with practitioners in your area. Um, mm -hmm. they do a lot of professional courses and webinars and stuff as well, but, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they interview people from all around the world. Mm -hmm. Lots of Brazil. Right. There's a lot of, Bra um, Brazilians are really advanced in myofunctional therapy and research as well. So that's pretty. Wow. Yes. Damn. Damn. Yeah. Brazilians are, they're sleepers, man, in this, in the health <laughs> space, right? They're like good. They're up on the research. A lot of uh, our most advanced research is based out of Brazil. So they invented the TRMR way of measuring for tongue tie, right? And then Audrey Yoon sort of modified it. Didn't like it come from there was the Kotlow measurement in America, mm -hmm. which just was it's too rudimentary. All it does is measure the distance from the frenum to the tip of the tongue, which doesn't tell the whole story. And then like myofunctional therapists were looking for better data on tongue tie and they found it in Brazil or something, right? Yeah, there is. Yeah. The Martinelli rating scale. Yeah. Uh, I believe. Right. Mar yeah. Uh -huh. So, and then, yeah, and then it got more advanced and now it's just not tongue tip elevation, but it's lingual palatal suction. So getting the back of the tongue up because they realize it's not just tip, it's back, middle and right. back. And now we also, um, Dr. Zog is doing research on this right now, but compensations. So you may be able to get a good range of motion of your tongue, but you might be compensating by sucking the whole floor of your mouth to get your tongue up. So wow. now they're coming up with a standardized way of measuring compensations with the floor of the mouth. So it's, it's yeah, that's why it's detailed. It's not just tongue tie, oh yeah, release it, whatever. There's, um, it's a detailed analysis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's- Go ahead and yawn. I saw you holding that one in. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> We're doing my, uh, my espresso shot is wearing off. Oh, no. Dunkin' Donuts? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys have Dunkin' Donuts on the West Coast? We do. I know it's a big East Coast thing, but we have it here. Yep. Yeah. they um, Dunkin' Donuts is huge out here. Mm -hmm. the, I think the it East was Coast runs first. on Dunkin'. That's what, that's what my East Coast friends have told me. <laughs> yeah. What do you guys have? Tim Hortons or is that Canada? I've never heard of that. Oh yeah, it's a that's a Canadian thing. Mm -hmm. You guys have In and Out Burger. That we do have. <laughs> we'll claim that. That's good stuff. <laughs> oh man! All right, Nicole. Uh, we're at two hours in change. Um, why don't we wrap it there? And um, thank you so much for coming on. And I hope we get a chance to speak again in the future. For sure. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.